But welcome everybody for this week's Rise and Tide Foundation lecture. And uh, many who are here or listening online have probably already watched or know of Dr. Raj Vidam through his presentation to the Rise Rising Tide Foundation last year on India's ancient India's untold story, which uh, was an incredible presentation. I since then I had periodically received messages from people all over the world asking when will Professor Vidam be speaking again. Um, wait no longer, it has arrived. However, you probably also would have encountered Dr. Vidam through his thousands and thousands of presentations delivered in, in venues. I mean, I, I, I don't know where you get the strength and endurance, but I, I, I think I have a sense of it. Because Professor Vidam, as, as people have, have encountered who have seen his presentations, have recognized, uh, is using a very specific method of analysis, which is intersectional, it's very powerful, it's very principled, and it doesn't simply locate an analysis of putting together the pieces that have been really obscured over centuries of, uh, of imperialism, of, of manipulation that has really destroyed India's ability to appreciate its own great legacy and the offer and the gifts that India has given to the world that have been really scrubbed, scrubbed clean, both from the rest of the world as well as from India itself. So I love the way that you're able to use both archaeology, uh, linguistics, the arts, astronomy, mathematics, and, and do it in a very holistic manner, which is very healthy. And I think it's something that we all need to sort of study as far as a method of top-down thinking that doesn't, um, is not lazy on the facts. Because many people who, who try to use a, a top-down holistic method, sometimes they get very lazy and make broad general claims too soon. But you uh, have a very different, much more rigorous approach that I think is just so healthy. So today, um, the the focus will be a little bit different, uh, and I, I'm I'm just curious to see where where Professor Vadam takes this in terms of the ancient uh, or, origin story of both Europe and India with a common focus. So, with that, I will say no more, uh, Professor. It's all yours. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Once again, it's a real pleasure to come back on the Rising Tide Foundation. I Thank you and your listeners for inviting me back. So with that, let me share my screen. Okay, so today's talk, you've set a high standard over there with your introduction, uh, Matt. So I, I do hope you can live up to some of the uh, things that you said about my methods. The nature of the topic today, it's so expansive in terms of time and space that uh, the quality of evidence that we have is not what we'd always like. So we have some that are high quality evidence, some medium quality evidence, and some that are low quality evidence. But nevertheless, I have not discarded anything. We'll, one will have to do the diligence to try and see the provenance of the data, where did this data come from, can we accept this data, and so on. So I've collated several things over here to show the joint history of India and Europe. So I hope uh, I can bring out some of those facts over here. And uh, there's obviously an elephant in the room, right? <laughs> so the narratives on Indian history, like you said, are vitiated thanks to racism, Western universalism, that something exists only if a Westerner takes note. Otherwise, it does not exist, that notion. Christian demonization of the other as pagans, heathens, colonization, obviously, with its ethnocide, genocides, and with a toxic mix of Marxism and today's notions of everybody wants to be a victim, right? So, so with all of these things, we are seeing that the narratives are so mashed up. So we don't know where to where, where to go with all of these things. So I hope that with today's talk, uh, I'll be able to question, at least if some people have thought that there's an immutable Western narrative out there on the history of the world, I hope that I will have shown to you enough uh, issues where you can raise red flags for yourself saying that maybe this narrator is not what it's cut out to be. So there's something else to this. Okay, but that is a prelude. I've already talked about this in the previous time I was in this forum. We have several forums, uh, uh, excuse me, frameworks imposed in the historiography of India. And these things have been things like the colonial uh, uh, perspective, the Eurocentric perspective, missionaries, the Socialist Academy of Bias and the Marxist. Every one of these uh, uh, people or agencies have brought in their ideologies 
imposed it in the history of India and led to a subversion of our identities in the present. And that is what we repeatedly see in the narration of Indian history. So some of the things I'm saying today will sound strange to you. What on earth is this? There's something else. We learn a textbook, something else over here. But bear with me, please. And uh, some of these topics also go to potentially sensitive areas. I assure you, I have no desire to uh, put down uh, any, any group of people or anything in the store. So these corruptions have been happening over 300 years. We have got colonial scholars, missionaries, Eurocentric scholars who are come in with certain biases, right? I call that the first colonial hegemony, 16th to 20th century, Portuguese, Dutch, French, British, hand in hand with Christian imperialism, where they brought in a perspective that Hinduism is a post-flood religion, is casted in their oppressors, Davidians, the oppressed people, Brahminical Aryans are all evil people. So this is the kind of uh, notion that has been imposed on the world, and people have internalized these values to the present day. And we have got uh, uh, the Eurocentric notions coming in with notions of linguistics, anthropology, and the notion of caste, and so on. So, Every one of these people have had convergent ideologies and that has led to something called an Aryan invasion migration theory that has led to great distortions of the Indian uh, history. Unfortunately, this is carried through till today. Uh, it is a received wisdom for our academia where they take this uh, notion of Aryan invasion and impose on it etic or outsider sociology, sociological lenses that are relevant for the Western experience. Things like, for example, modernism or postmodernism or feminism or many other things because of the lived experience of the West, these social lenses are imported into India and force fit in the Indian diaspora. Uh, so this, this is what we're seeing over here. And we, it goes hand in hand with archaeology and genetics. So we have today uh, this whole methodology is propped up by left-leaning socialist academia and a Marxist academia. And so we continue to see with circular dependencies, questionable assumptions, we are seeing these narratives continue to the present day. So in a, a high level uh, framework, I can say that there are several ethic frameworks imposed in the history of India with, with these kind of people, the colonial Eurocentric missionary, socialist academia and Marxist, and I've shown a kind of a, a, a cartoonish way of looking at it, but nevertheless, at a high level, this is indeed true. The colonial people want to uphold biblical chronology, so that is their reason, and show Hindus as primitive, backward, stagnant, superstitious, discriminatory. And the Eurocentric people want to show the same and to show superiority of the white Europeans. Missionaries want uh, uh, those things, and in addition to promote Christianity and to show in India class conflicts, and the victimhood of several groups who they wish to convert. And the socialist academia, they come in with the same, uh, to bring in an oppressor, oppressed kind of a narrative on the Indians, and to show Hindus as primitive, backward, stagnant, and, uh, and so on, and uh, history from below, the subaltern, if you will, and these kind of things. And the Marxist, yes, they too are interested in showing that uh, the past is primitive. It's got to be jettisoned for progress and all of history is a history of class conflicts. And they wish to show class conflicts everywhere in India. And they also want to uh, show the subaltern, oppressor, oppressed, narratives, claim victimhood and these kinds of things. We also have a deracinated framework in India, Southern India especially, in one state, Dravidianism which has internalized these values, become deracinated in the process, and they want to show that they are distinct from Southern, uh, from Hindus, who they claim are Aryans, and they show a, a similar kind of thinking over here, and they're hand in hand, they work with Christianity over here. Today, we've got two more forces that are vitiating the atmosphere, which is Islamism and wokeism. They also have a similar kind of perspective, and these things do happen, unfortunately, and uh, today's uh, uh, narratives are vitiated by these things. We also have a whole lot of global trends of billionaires like uh, Soros, George Soros, people like uh, uh, this Iranian billionaire, I forget his name, and uh, several other people who have vitiated the atmosphere once again with a whole lot of networks that are shadowy, supporting a whole lot of media out there to create a certain perspective. So we are seeing that extremism is hiding behind a cloak of victimhood and squashing dissent with a threat to cancel you out in the cancel culture if you were to say things that are not acceptable by the mob mentality over here. This is what we're seeing. This is an illusion of mass unrest with media echo chambers, high decibel pitches over here, street power, 
pressure on government to make laws convenient to the lobbies. So these are the kind of pressures that we are seeing today. And that has led to a, a whole lot of things like uh, spurious army invasion, migration. This is the roots of everything. This is the root of everything in the Indian uh, context. And I, I will not uh, spend time on this because there's a lot to speak about India and Europe. But I needed to tell you that because there's a prelude to why what I'm saying might be different from what you have seen in textbooks and so on. So let me start the story with India and Europe over the ages from 50,000 years ago to around 3,000 years ago by looking at different slices of the data. So in this case, I choose to first start the genetic slice. What does modern genetics say about who the Europeans are and the Indians are? And even before I say that, there's a preload. Some of us look at this and say, how on earth did people get along in an era when there were horse buggies or uh, bullock carts and things like that? There were no aeroplanes, no ships, and no uh, uh, automobiles. How did they get across? Well, believe it or not, if you go to Google and try to search for the walking distance from Cape Town all the way here to this uh, Magadan over here, somewhere in Siberia, you'd see that it is a distance of 22,300 uh, kilometers, and it takes about 4,400 hours. And in two years, a person walking, determined person, could reach from the south to the north. So it's not as fantastical as we'd like to think that there's human contact between various parts of the world. Yes, it was there in a, a, a earlier era. So that's the prelude. So Stephen Oppenheimer, uh, he, uh, he collated some of the evidence that is there in genetics on the maternal mitochondrial DNA. And he wanted to show what is the relationship between people of the world, how the world is populated. And he shows an out of Africa model that starts approximately uh, uh, 90,000 to 80,000 years ago, when a group of individuals cross this Gulf of Oman and so on, reached India and went through the triangular part of India all the way to Sumatra, a generation by generation migration. And uh, uh, this was this is a uh, uh, result based on the existing maternal mitochondrial DNA. This doesn't mean to say that the world was an empty space when uh, before this migration happened. Yes, there were archaic humans living. There were Neanderthals in Europe. There were uh, uh, Denisovans. There were all kinds of people. India has got evidence of archaic humans who lived there in addition. So this is the uh, mutations that we can trace back to Africa. That is what we are talking about over here. So by 74,000 years ago, we know there was a super volcano in uh, Sumatra, and that led to a 1,000-year ice age because it was such a big volcanic explosion, and it, uh, uh, the, the population crashed. And today, statistically, we, we can see that we are all the product of about 10,000 adults, breeding adults, who survived that event, all of us. All non-African populations of the world are related to these 10,000 people who are expected to have survived this crash. This is a volcan uh, archaeological site in India where even today they find this volcanic ash. Then uh, a repopulation of India took place from both the east as well as the west. And about 55,000 years ago, the ice ages that had covered most of Northern Europe, Americas, uh, Northern America, that area with glaciers, that had receded. When that receded, it also coincided with the dying out of the Neanderthals, and that led to a vacuum over there, which is filled in by uh, humans from this part of uh, the world, basically India, who crossed the Bosphorus and became the ancestors of the future Europeans, if you will. So uh, they landed up over there in this time frame. And about 45 to 40,000 years ago, we see groups of people from uh, uh, approximately Sumeria, Gujarat, from the eastern part of India. They coalesce in, uh, in Siberia and they go on and uh, 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 cross the Bering Strait and uh, la land bridge at that time and become the future uh, uh, Native Americans about 25,000 years ago. So this is what we learned from, uh, 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 from, from maternal mitochondrial DNA. Now we can take a look at various other data also to try and uh, make some sense out of all of these things, but the past is so distant that we don't have high quality data to say much. So most of our narratives of who we are today 
come from the last 20, 22,000 years ago, when the last glacial uh, maximum receded about 25,000 years ago, 22,000 years ago, when that receded, it also led to the onset of agriculture and the Mesolithic era and things of that nature. So if we take a look at, for example, this map may not be very big for you to read, but in India, we are seeing tropical grasslands over here. And here you're seeing tundra kind of desert. Here too, you're seeing a tropical desert. So most of the places, either you had a tundra kind of vegetation or a desert kind of vegetation, with few places where agriculture could have hosted a huge population 22,000 years ago. And India is one of those places. Africa is one of those places. South America is one of those places. And this is what we see from the reconstruction that scientists have done about uh, uh, how, how uh, uh, agriculture might have been, vegetation might have been this time frame. And if you look at this uh, uh, um, logarithmic plot over here in time, millions of years ago, going to thousands of years ago over here, we're interested in this time frame, approximately 20,000 years ago, when we had the last glacial maximum, when the global temperatures was much below where we are today eventually heating up around 10,000 years ago, leading to the glaciers receding and the Neolithic era starting out, the agriculture and so on. And somewhere here's where we are today, with the projection of what's going to happen in the future. And uh, somewhere around here is where uh, 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 scientists try to mark a period as Mesolithic. So if you're talking about the Europeans, we started with saying that genetics is saying that they are this ancient people over here. Then who are the present day uh, Europeans, we can trace back at least to this Mesolithic era, where we can say that uh, uh, they are composed of the populations called the Caucasus hunter-gatherer, Eastern farmers, and the Western hunter-gatherer. These are the three populations that have contributed to the present day Europeans, if you will. And they trace their path to about 50,000 years ago to these migrations out of India that I talked about. So this is who they are um, uh, thought to be. And this one tells you a lot in this little graph over here, 20,000 years, 6,000 years ago. So these are the source populations, if you will. This is the ancient North Eurasian population from whom has come this Western Siberian hunter-gatherer and from them to the Eastern European hunter-gatherer and the Western hunter-gatherer contributing to this population. So scientists are uncovering a whole lot of interesting data over here. And one of them is one would wonder when did the skin tone change in the present day Europeans? Given that, uh, for example, in Britain, in the peats, they found this uh, uh, specimen where there's called a cheddar man. And the reconstruction based upon the DNA and others show him to be uh, uh, of, of a darker pigmentation. So it's not surprising because today we know Western hunter-gatherers, they did have dark skin, blue eyes, and dark hair based upon the alleles in their uh, DNA. So where did this blondness come from? And we can trace it back today to the ancient North Eurasians from whom we have got uh, uh, archeological finds, the Tarim Basin in China, those mummies have got blonde hair. So that, that led scientists on to this uh, uh, notion that this is what this could be. And these people have contributed to the Eastern hunter-gatherer. So eventually uh, things have changed the addition of Anatolian uh, uh, farmers and, and so on. So this is a complex picture. So things are still changing, very complex picture. But the key issue is, this SLC24A5, this is a mutation in the uh, 15th chromosome of the human body. And this is supposed to have come around, ar arisen around 30,000 years ago, perhaps in the vicinity of Iran and India, somewhere from that area is where this allele has come and uh, moved on to this area. So moving on to uh, about 10,000 BC to 4,000 BC, about 12,000 years ago, we are seeing the Neolithic. Neolithic is marked by agriculture. How did agriculture spread to Europe? Well, we know today it's come from Southwest Asia to Europe, for example, Anatolia and other places. There are, there are people who have tried to trace this based upon paleobotany as well as uh, genetics and so on. So this is a reconstructed picture of some of uh, how uh, farming might have spread to these various people. And this part of the graph is something that I don't agree with based on a number of evidence. They also show that agriculture came from Anatolia into India, which is a wrong picture. So this direction is questionable. 
but there is no problem about this direction from this part on. And I'll try to present evidence for why this is questionable going forward. So this is a paper that came out in 2019 that tried to talk about ancestry clients, these ancient people, what is their genetic lineages looking like? That is the kind of question they set out to answer. And they identified several groups over here. This South Eurasian family in the early Holocene means uh, around 12,000 years ago. You, the Indus client is the Indian, the Central Asian client, Caucasus, and the European client. So you're seeing from here, 4,500 BCE, this is the orange color, if you will, that orange color is spreading out. You see them in Iran, you see that in Anatolia, and that is the orange color. Even here in Yamnaya, you've seen that, including the Anatolian uh, uh, farmers and so on. So this color comes from this side uh, uh, over here, and this color is coming from this side. So looking at it, we can say that there's an influx of farming technology from this region of the world that has gone into Anatolia, and from Anatolia spread into Europe. That is the picture that comes out of this. And if I make an assertion like that, I need to provide at least some evidence for why this, this picture says what it is. This is a paper that came out in Cell in 2019 that is talking about the Indus Valley client in this orange color with a mix of Andamanese hunter-gatherers going back to an ancient time. They had a common ancestor about 40,000 years ago, if you will. And around uh, a much earlier time, 12,000 or be, uh, before 12,000 years or so, these lineages split off. And if you go to Iranian hunter-gatherers, there are 100% of the same color, which is Indus Valley client. And as you go down in time, you see the Iranian herders, early farmers, if you will, and going even further down to 4,000 BC, you're seeing Iranian farmers, Eastern, with the same ancestry, but they're starting to get Anatolian ancestry over here, a mix of these two is happening. So the latest genetic studies are still, still saying there's an impact out of India in this time frame. And one more data point, which is uh, very uh, intriguing, this came in uh, genome biology in 2007, where this researcher wanted to show the genetic ancestor of the common house mice. And what we are seeing is uh, the house mice ancestry he tracked back to India, anywhere from 40 to 12,000 years ago. And it is from India, it goes to Madagascar, to, uh, to Northern Africa, to Europe, to Southeast Asia, to China, and so on. We know today that house mice have got close relationship with humans, right? So wherever this agricultural produce and stored in a barn or elsewhere, mice come there. And when humans migrate out, the mice follow them. So here too is a indirect evidence, if you will, by looking at mice ancestry that is talking about the same thing. This is a paper that came out in 2022 in Science in Nature, and this is talking about millets. And they show that third millennium millets are from India. It comes into this uh, uh, fertile crescent in this area. All these uh, uh, red is first millennium, blue is second millennium, and uh, yellow is a third millennium. So this paper also seems to say that Millet is an agricultural innovation that has come from India into, uh, into Mesopotamia in this time frame. So taken together with all of these, we can say that the Neolithic civilizations were influenced by India in several ways. The genetics is saying that, and we are seeing in archaeobotany uh, showing similar kind of things. One more paper that came out in Current Biology in 2022 and wanted to address a question of something called lactase persistence. Now, as human mammals, we are able to digest milk when we are young, but we lose the ability to digest milk uh, in our uh, later times. But then how did Europe get lactase persistence, meaning the ability to digest milk even in adulthood? And several people tried to see, is that because of migration or is it because of natural selection or what is it? And it appears that such an ability has come in Europe only in the last 3000 years, the ability to digest milk. Very, very interesting to uh, see these things. All right, so far I've addressed uh, uh, the, the joint ancestry of the Indians and Europeans going back to an ancient period of time, looking at genetics, looking from the Mesolithic era, going all the way to the Neolithic era, looking at agricultural innovations and so on. I'd like to take a different slice of the data now. 
what can we infer from very early religion? And when I say early, I mean 50,000 to 25,000 years ago. It may look bombastic to you, but then uh, there are some hints that we have from the ancient past that we can see. And that is of shamans. So in the genetic migrations, we learned that as an out of Africa model, India is the first place outside Africa where resources, climate, safety to ensure provided an equilibrium for the migrants who for the first time with a full belly you can sit under a tree look at the stars and ask who am i what is my purpose in the world such a philosophical musing could not happen uh, in a place where survival is at a, a premium right if you're in a desert uh, kind of place or in a, a harsh winter environment you can't ask these kind of questions it only comes when uh, you have everything so the shamans is a North Asian word from Pali, uh, which is a shamana, basically, ascetic, monk, and so on. It's a technique of religious ecstasy. They are intermediaries between the human and spirit world. They do dancing, beating drums, smoking, get into trance-like state, and they treat ailments by mending spiritual imbalances. They have reverence for nature, trees, animals, sky, world, ancestor, spirit, snake. It is a precursor of tantra, shaktism, and shaivism. Very intriguingly, we have some archaeological evidence for this. And this is 30,000 years ago in Czechoslovakia, in the Pavlov Hills, a lot of intense archaeology is taking place where they found several artifacts going back 30,000 years ago. And one of them was a human skeleton with a red color on it, painted red before laid to rest. And it was found to be of a woman's body. And a uh, uh, a body of a fox was placed in one hand. The fox is an indication that the person was a shaman. It has a long history as a shamanic spiritual guide. And then they also found near the grave bone flutes, oven filled with 3,000 small pieces of baked clay, just like talisman. In the old days, people have a spell, wear a talisman, a protection, and things like that. We are seeing things like that in the shape of human feet and so on. So clearly, we are seeing that this person 30,000 years ago was already a shaman doing some kind of spiritual healing in Czechoslovakia, bang at the time of migrations out of India going uh, uh, when the ice ages have ended. We're seeing that evidence over here. And if you, uh, you can go all over the world, you see this common culture. If you go to Mongolia, you see uh, shamans over there. You go to Asia, there's an India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, or in the Hmong people, China, Laos, Vietnam. Same things, they beat a skin drum, they do dancing, they get into a trance-like state, this, uh, cure imbalances. Russia, you're seeing similar kind of uh, activity. In Russia, uh, Siberia area, you're seeing beating of drums. And if you uh, uh, go to uh, Siberia and Alaska, similarly, you're seeing the natives with uh, beating of drums and getting a trance-like state. Native American, the, the Blackfoot, Dakota Sioux, the Kickapoo, Okap Okipa Sun Ceremony, all similar kind of behaviors, all the way to South America, North America, South America, Ecuador, Brazil, Chile, you're seeing the same thing, the beating of drums, smoking of drugs, getting into a state, dancing. So you have to ask a question. How is it we are seeing a global similarity in the practices, this cultural practice of having shamans? How is it they have the same uh, kind of practices? Is it coincidence? Is it something convergence where different cultures have similar kind of things? Or could they have had a common origin? If they had a common origin, one key point would have been India, where they were left during this migration periods that genetics is telling us and having gone to these different places. So early religion might have originated here and gone out to these various places. Today, we see that even in uh, Central America and so on in India, we've got iconography showing Shiva, who has this drum, uh, uh, famous at dancing. We are seeing the Pashupati scene, similarly in uh, Mohenjo-daro, 3000 BCE, and so on. Very, very uh, intriguing that uh, we have these all over the place. All right, that was the, uh, I started the genetics, then I went to early religion. Now I'm going to take early archaeology and saying, what can archaeology tell us? Once again, this is a bombastic time frame, 20,000 to 5,000 years ago. And we want to see what can, what do we have in archaeology in that time frame? And very intriguing to see that all over India, we have got these menhirs, dolmens, uh, labyrinths, stone circles, and so on. These are 
whether you go to southern india karnataka eastern india arunachal pradesh in north northwest uh, in pakistan or southern india kerala erode other places we are seeing a common culture of all of these things now the people who wrote the history of india they put this down to uh, um, uh, mesolithic people in india in 2000 bce who did all of these activities but i question that i question the time frame because i don't know whether there's enough uh, information for them to do that what we see is there is a worldwide uh, culture of these things let me hide this uh, controls so there's a worldwide culture of menhirs to hero stones to gravestones we are seeing this in some place in germany we are seeing this in wales we are seeing this in ireland in brittany france in sardinia eritrea we are seeing this in eritrea in manipur in india in czechoslovakia republic a similar culture so we got to start scratching our head we are seeing similarity in all of these places and going forward dolmens once again a worldwide culture if we go to cornwall in uk we are seeing this again cornwall cornwall and this is a neolithic in kerala look at the architecture they are exactly the same in south korea the architecture is exactly the same south korea south korea brittany in brittany in ireland in germany netherlands portugal sicily sicily quebec in sicily so if you take a look at these pictures you have to as thinking people ask why do we see a worldwide common culture over here the architecture is similar the cultural practice is similar we have today's archaeologists dating this to around 5500 years before present all all these places stone circles once again similar 11000 to 5000 years ago in gobekli tepe we are seeing these things stone circles we are seeing this in golan heights in senegal in france in england the famous stone circles in england a stone hinge in spain in mongolia in india telangana in gambia so we are seeing again a similarity whether it was for astronomical purposes whether it was for some other ancestral worship whatever we are seeing a uh, uh, similarity over here and i want to call attention to that i'm not going to read too much into that other than telling you here is the data the data suggests a common origin or people from a region who know these things taking it out of different parts of the world we can look at the early divinity slides also so by this i refer to india and europe between 15000 to 3000 years ago and like to look at uh, traces of divinity over here what is seeing this picture are the twins the twins in the in the european tradition who are associated with horse so there are many many scholars starting with max miller who has studied comparative uh, what they call mythology uh, which i believe is uh, not a good word to use here but uh, uh, many people have studied this here i'm referring to the greek scholar kazanas from uh, uh, the journal of indo european studies many vedic deities can be found in several ancient european people for example agni the god of fire in slavic it is orgon ignis in latin and uh, and so on and, and you see aryaman ashwin i'm going to call attention to ashwin later in the celtic people you see is epona and the god the horse identity in the greek people i can't read this greek word but uh, that's what it is and you seeing in irish baltic people then dios you're seeing in hittite people the roman people and jupiter in the roman germanic people the lithuanian people indra again the mitanni is the kesai it's a celtic people we are seeing their names maruts and uh, 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 surya i'm going to call attention later to surya ashwins and ushas so please note that surya in the kesaites in the greek in the roman in the uh, 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 what is this now old norse norse in the uh, various other places baltic you're seeing the names used for them ushas in the greek in roman aurora and uh, so on so clearly we are seeing that uh, um, the the vedic deities seem to be referenced in many other ancient european uh, uh, cultures and civilizations of course the linguists have got a story for this they say there was a proto indo european where there was a proto language religion also and this uh, proto religion had all these divinities that went out because of uh, uh, linguistic migrations that's how they evolved that is a story from linguistics but we are seeing data to the contrary over here so let me continue on 
So there are common things that we find in these uh, 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 deities, elements. For example, I just put two or three here. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. Slaying of a serpent. Indra slays Vritra in Sanskrit. In the Avistan, we are seeing the Janata Zim slays a serpent, Azi. In the Hittite, you're seeing this person slaying a beast. In the Slavic, Perun is slaying the dragon, Willis. The drink of immortality for the gods. Soma, Amrita in the uh, Sanskrit. The Tharani, this one, overcoming death in Avistan. In the Norse, we have the Mimir's well. Battle of gods, the Devas versus Ashuras in Sanskrit. Of the Devas and Angra Mainyu versus Ahura Mazda in Avistan. Olympian gods versus the Titans in Greek. Asir versus Venir in Norse. So there are many of these parallels. I, I don't have space or time to talk about them, but clearly there is a common origin to many of these stories that we see. I'd like to end the section by calling out the antiquity of a Rig Vedic story on Surya, Ushas, and Ashwins. These are divinities we have seen in all the other European uh, places. And I have done some research on this. This is based on the Rig Vedic verse over here. For example, it is saying Usha's mighty goddess awakened the Ashwins and uh, appear Usha's is a goddess of dawn. So it's referenced that Ashwins are coming with the dawn. Ashwins are referenced in Indian astronomy as a couple of stars. And these stars are this Beta Ariatis. This is in the Greek tradition. So uh, this is the star it is. So it is referencing by a Rig Vedic story to, uh, uh, um, to the sun or Ushas appearing at dawn in the winter solstice in this, in the backdrop of the these stars, Ashwini Nakshatra. That is what is referencing to. Because of something called precision of equinox, this observation will not be true over time because precision will make it uh, uh, change over time. So you can track it back in planetarium software, which is what I've done over here, and track it back to 7200 BCE when this verse might have been composed, talking about this one as well as the story of Surya and uh, his wife and his uh, children, Ashwins, the twins. So uh, for a long time, this is what it was. The story was 7,200 BC and people said, all right, let it be. Then the surprising thing is in 2022, unexpected validation came from this nature papers. This paper came out uh, talking about a solar storm 9,125 years before present, smack down in 7,200 BCE. A second paper said tree rings reveal proton events in 7176 BC, once again, 7,200 rounded off over here. So I have written this whole thing up, which you can uh, reference in this uh, in this link over here, rajvedamedium.com. Once upon a time, 9,000 years ago, you'll find a detailed write-up where I'm calling attention to the Carrington event, which was a solar storm and uh, how brilliant it was. And this event, scientists are saying, this proton event that we're talking about here was 10 times greater than the Carrington event, which means, Anywhere in the globe, you'd have found uh, what we call today as northern lights. The aurora that we normally see in Alaska or going to Antarctica, that's where we normally see it, restricted to northern latitudes or southern latitudes. You don't find them at the equatorial regions and so on. But this proton event was so great that you'd have seen these uh, northern lights all the way perhaps even in India. So this story uh, uh, is a remembrance of that. That's what I'm calling it out. And uh, this validation from these. So why did I say this? Because we got Indo-European divinities who seem to be derived from the Rig Veda. The linguists are saying that this is around 3000 BC, 1500 BC and so on. But I'm showing to you here, this incidence goes back 9,000 years. So it is very, very intriguing to see this. Going forward, we see the famous Mitra panel. This is there in a museum in Paris, I believe, uh, from uh, 100 current era. So on one side of the panel, it shows this person who's killing a bull. And you see a dog over here. You see a scorpion here. And you see a snake over here. And behind that, you see these divinities looking from the sky down over here. You see what is identified in India as a Shivalinga. And you see the, uh, the these people around over here. So this is a reference to the changing of the vernal equinox from uh, 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 from the Orion, from the Orion to uh, Rohini is um, Aldebaran. So from uh, from Orion to Aldebaran, when precession changed 
which would appear the vernal equinox position that goes back to 4000 BCE. This is there in India. You can reference to, once again to my medium.com story, Mitra slaying of the bull, to show how ancient the story is. This story is there also in Mohenjadaro, Harappa. Harappa is now 3000 BCE. In this scene, we are seeing the slaying of the bull here, and one more where this warrior is slaying the bull over here. This is an ancient story coming out, marking the passage of time, if you will. But uh, uh, European historians have put this down to the Mitra panel, an early religion along with Christianity, Manichaeanism and Mitra worship and so on, going to around 100 current era and so on. They're referencing uh, uh, this imagery to that, but there's a much deeper uh, meaning to this if you uh, make reference to this Indian story. And uh, I also wrote one more on medium called the ancient Celts and the Ramayana. Very intriguingly, Ramayana is one of those epics in India, which various people have tried to date. Various you'll find uh, dates from 5000 BC, some people even more ancient and so on. But if you were to list the properties of a hero in the Celt, the hero is called Fionn Macul. He's virtuous, wise, uh, compassionate. He's born after his father dies. He studies under a poet called Finn Asis and uh, Warcraft from this uh, person in the forest. At 10 years old, he kills a fire-breathing uh, monster called Tauta di Danan, which is a progeny of Danu or Aditi. His wife is transformed to a deer by an angry druid because she rejects his advances. And Fionn spends years searching for her. And he builds a causeway, which you can see in Ireland even today, to go and battle with a giant on an island. And... Uh, uh, Amazingly, there's an exact parallel in the Ramayana. Rama is virtuous, compassionate, wise. His father's under a curse that when his son goes away from him, he'll die. As a teen, he goes to a forest and learns uh, Warcraft from Vashishta and Vishwamitra, two sages. And as a teen, he kills Asuras, who are the progeny of Diti. Now, Diti and, uh, and uh, Aditi are two goddesses in the Vedic tradition from whom have come the Asuras and the Devas. And there is a uh, there is a, a 90 degree reversal, 180 degree reversal of that when you go to Iran, where the devas become the bad guys, the ashuras are the good guys. So in the in the, the Celt story, we are seeing that the, the bad person is Dhanu or Aditi's progeny. But in India, it is Diti's progeny who are bad. So very interesting to see that. And Rama's wife Sita desires a shape-shifting golden deer when she's in exile and she's abducted. Rama spends years searching for her. And the story says that Rama built this bridge, Rama Setu, between India and Sri Lanka to uh, go to that island, battle with the villain and uh, save his, uh, rescue his wife. Very interesting to see these parallels. So I just call this out as an intriguing uh, story over there. Mm -hmm. We also have, if you look at the Celts, they uh, celebrate something called, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this word, but I'm calling it Samhain. I don't think my pronunciation is right. And uh, Indians have something called Pitrupaksha. So Indians identify when the sun starts going towards a southern region called Dakshinayana, six-month course, and they refer to that path as a path of the ancestors between July, June 21st to uh, December 21st, with an equinox on September 22nd. And soon after the equinox, when you're deep in ancestry, ancestor territory, on the new moon over there, Indians celebrate an offering to ancestors called Pitrupaksha. Amazingly, the Celts do the same. They observe the Samhain as a feast for their ancestors, halfway between equinox, which is September 22nd, and December 21st. These days was normalized to October 31st. They leave offerings for ancestors, and uh, they were termed as pagans by the Christians who usurped this festival from 9th century onwards on November 1st and 2nd as All Saints Day, All Souls Day with October 31st celebrated in uh, Western Hemisphere as Halloween. So very intriguing to see this uh, uh, cultural tradition going back to ancient times. Now, a little something to talk about the Indian evidence for people going out of India. In the Rig Veda, we have allusion to a battle of 10 kings, where the, all these tribes on this side, they fought with King Sudas, with the sage called Vishwamitra, Vashishta on one side, Vishwamitra on the other side. In this battle, Sudhas defeated all of these people, and these tribes were forced to migrate out of India. This is what the tradition says. The tradition says these tribes called Alina, Anu, Brigus, all of these people 
were left India after this. Now we don't have a date on the story because Rig Vedic dating is a contentious topic in linguistics and so on. There is no date on this. So uh, uh, let me not even uh, put a date on this. So going forward, we are seeing today there are some people, for example, Srikant Telegiri, who is a linguist, who's tried to analyze some of the linguistic claims. They're trying to identify these tribes with Indo-European tribes mentioned the Rig Veda. For example, the Dasa tribe, Abistan Dahi, or the uh, Turkmenistan Dahi, or Romanian Dacian, Brigu with these people in Turkey, this Balana with the Baluchi people, the Bolan, these people with the Parthava, this, uh, these people with, uh, with southern Afghanistan, Pashua, with Pakhtun, these people with Kiva in Uzbekistan, the uh, Alina with the Alans in uh, South Russia, or with the Helen in uh, Greek. And, and so on. So we are seeing that uh, there are attempts made to track for linguistically what these tribes mentioned in Rig Veda are and can we identify them with these uh, so-called Indo-European people who live in these areas. And recently, uh, one of my uh, friends also wrote this book, uh, Jiji Travi, on the rivers of Rig Veda, where he called attention to these migrations that took place from India, the Anu and the Drihu tribes who went out uh, to these various places between the Slavic, Baltic, Germanic, Celtic, Italic people. Now, this looks fantastic if you just read this, but based on the data provided so far, talking about the Neolithic era, the Neolithic uh, uh, um, the innovations that went out there, the genetics, the archaeology, as thinking people, we must just ask, how do we make sense out of all of these things? Are there alternate explanations? Or is this the best explanation that can fit it? These are the kind of questions that Beam was asked, but there's an intriguing uh, one over here. So I'd like to show you some artifacts to support this prehistoric contact, right? These are very ancient contacts I'm talking about. Intriguingly, in, uh, in uh, Maharashtra, which is a central state in India, in, the, in a place called Ratnagiri, we are seeing scarab, which is uh, 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 on the petroglyph on the on the rock over here, which is twelve thousand years old, based on the archaeologists at Deccan College. This exact same motif is there in sarcophagus in Egypt, going back to two thousand BCE. Very intriguing to uh, see this connection across time, almost thousand years. In science, there was this. Uh, uh, a story about Ozzy. Ozzy was an Iceman who was found in the Alps, and they thought it was a recent murder, seeing how well that body was preserved. But they discovered it is 5,300 years old, and a lot of studies have happened on his on this Iceman. One of the studies was to see his stomach contents, to see what was his last meal, and so on. And they found uh, this uh, H. pylori bacteria. This H. pylori bacteria has also got a genetic lineage, and the strain that he hosted resembles the Asian strains found in Southern Asia or in India. Very interesting to see this. So how on earth did this man who died on the Swiss Alps, Italian Alps rather, how on earth did he have an Indian connection? Did he eat a curry meal or did he have social relations with an Indian woman or whatever? Very, very interesting to uh, see this. Then we know that there was a monsoon failure in India for about 100 years, around 2000 BCE. That was a time frame when a lot of people migrated out of India, 2000 BCE. And this science paper in 2019 is talking about cattle genomics, the fertile crescent. It is talking how suddenly there was a widespread introgression of zebu. Zebu is this humped bull, very familiar Indian cattle into, uh, into this region. And it says it was stimulated at the onset of the current geological age 4,200 years ago by a multi-century drought. This was very favored in that region because Indian cattle are arid adapted as opposed to Italian cattle that would die very soon in a drought. So this was very uh, valued in these cultures. And you can see that in this Akkadian seal in the lower museum. This was a palace freco in the island of Crete, Gnosis Palace, if I'm not mistaken, where on restoring this palace, they found this freckle, this very familiar Indian langur monkey, which you find even today in India. What is it doing in Greece? This animal is not endemic to Europe. It does not belong there. It is 1600 BCE, clearly pointing out the fact that there was trade, culture, as well as intellectual exchange from India to this region. 
we find many more parallels between the Minoans and the Southern Indians, for example, we find that bull jumping was very big in the Minoan culture. We see that all over the place, the motifs were there, the Hittite ways and others. Even today in India, we find the practice of Jallikattu in Tamil Nadu, where a similar practice is, uh, is done. And many other similarities, the griffin freckles in Minoan art, eagle with lion body, very similar to the Garuda, uh, Minotaur, which is the buffalo head, human body, demon, same as the Mahishasura, this is a buffalo body with a demon. Uh, it appears prominently in Hinduism. And Thesis kills a minotaur in a labyrinth, helped by a princess who gives the hero a thread to escape the maze. In the Indian tradition, the goddess Devi, she kills Mahishasura with weapons given by various divinities. And there is a labyrinth in Crete, there are labyrinths in southern India, which the archaeologists have put to the so-called Iron Age. Minamans practice cremation and burial. Southern India practice burial as well as cremation, as well as empty DNA studies that are talking about uh, connections now between, between these two cultures. Very interesting, intriguing to see these things. I have talked about this often. You give me any Greek story, any Greek story, and I'll show you a parallel with an Indian story. I often talk about this missing seventh sister in the Greek tradition, the Pleiades, virginal companions of the goddess Artemis. And one day they're playing in a, a lake and the uh, um, Orion, Orion is a hunter and a serial predator at that. So he sees these girls, he's enamored by them, he chases them all over the place. Artemis is wild, she goes to Zeus and says, protect my, my girls. Zeus doesn't care. So eventually Artemis has Orion killed by a, a scorpion. And uh, Zeus makes both Orion and the Pleiades as stars in the sky. Orion is this huge constellation, Pleiades is a small constellation. And the thing is that the Greek story references seven sisters. But if you look at the Pleiades today, you only see six of them. Where is the seventh one? So this the tradition says the seventh sister was uh, Merope, who had an affair with a mortal man and hid her face in shame. So because of that, you can't see her. That is a tradition. There's an exact parallel in the Indian context too. And uh, uh, this, this, this has reference with a slight twist to it. Agni is officiating at the home of the seven rishis and he's besotted with their lovely wives. He sees this, their wives and is really enamored by them. He's ashamed of himself and he goes off to practice meditation and tapasya to atone for his uh, uh, transgression. And his companion is Swaha. And she has unrequited love for Agni. So she practices deception. She knows his uh, weakness. And she, she assumes the form of the Saptarishi's wives. And she seduces Agni. And she could not take the form of the seventh wife, Arundhati. Her chastity is legendary in India. So she could not take her form. But only the six other sisters. So the six-headed Kartikeya or Skanda was born, causing great disturbance. The forest dwellers go to the gods and say, we saw this illicit romance of Agni with these people, but then the wives are all innocent. So they left their husbands for the great bear, the Saptarishi, and they left them and became the Pleiades. So this is the Indian story. The seventh sister, Arundhati, she remains the husband, Vashishta. She's here, Mizar Alcor, that's a twin star in the great bear. She remains over there. So in both cases, there's a missing seventh sister, but there's a reverse, right? There's the same notion of illicit romance and so on. So slight changes, stories are the same between Greek and uh, Indian traditions. This is the very famous Kundestrup Caldron. This is found in Denmark and dated by archaeologists around 200 BCE. It shows this figurine over here. So this person with antlers uh, head and uh, uh, surrounded by animals like the Lord of the Forest, if you will. And this iconography, many have remarked, it is exactly the same as a Mohenjo-daro Pashupati seed going back to 2400 BCE, where it's wearing a similar horned figure over here, surrounded by animals and, and so on. So what is this uh, Indus iconography doing in Denmark of all places in 200 BCE? One more of the data points that I'm presenting over there. All right, let me race through the remaining. We have the language model. I've shown you many slices, and here I'm trying to show you on language. India and Europe between 10,000 years to 5,000 years ago. Of course, linguists will say 3, 5,000 years ago to 3,000 years ago, but I'm pushing this date back. Ever since William Jones, who was a colonial person who came to India, he found there's a common relation between Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek. 
Europeans have been a quest for who are they as a people from colonial times. And this led to the notion that there's an ancestral language called Proto-Indo-European, which they reconstructed in academia. There is no evidence that such a language exists. There is no archaeological evidence, no books, no people talking that, no cultural memory, nothing. It was reconstructed and supposed to be in Central Asia between Caspian Sea and Black Sea, from whom these daughter languages, Balto-Slavic, Germanic, Celtic, Italic, Hellenic, Indo-Iranian to uh, uh, Sanskrit have come about. So the Eurocentric people came about with notions of comparative li method and linguistics to, uh, to, to show these things. And the frameworks they used, like I said, they came about with uh, sound laws, meaning that A greater than B means A is an older form of sound changing to a newer form of sound. And laws like, for example, Grimm's law were proposed where Ba is older than Ba, older than Pa, older than Fa. Da is older than Da, than Ta, than Ta. So, so these are the kind of notions they came about. Where did these rules come about? Who said about this chronology? Your guess is as good as mine. But they came about with these pulled out of a hat. But with these laws, they tried to propose these relationships. And they observed things like this. They said that we have a word called Pada in Sanskrit, meaning foot. They said there's an old Proto-Indo-European language uh, word called pods from where Pada has come and these things. Similarly, three is a Sanskrit uh, three. That's where it's come. Or uh, things like this, Dashan, Madhu, and all of these are Sanskrit words from where they propose on this side, Proto-Indo-European. And on this side, the Ru, where the Pa becomes Fa, and this Pada becomes foot in Proto-Germanic, becomes foot in English. So these are the kind of uh, rules that were proposed by the Europeans to show how languages evolved over time. And as an example, the, we can take the wheel. This is a famous bullock cart you see in every village in India. This is also there in Harappa, if you will. And the technology of the bullock cart is what we're interested in. A civilization that's got bullock cart must have words in that language for the wheel, for the yoke, for the axle, for every other things. And you see the word for wheel is chakra in Sanskrit, Latin rotem, Greek kuklos, yoke is yoga, lugam, and so on. Nave is nabya, umbilicus, axa, axis, and so on. So the proposed reconstruction, they say there was an ancient Proto-Indo-European ancestral language where there's a word called kweklo. Star means that is not a real word. It has been reconstructed in academia. From that proposed word, we are the Proto-Indo-Iranian, again reconstructed, called Kekro, from where we are Sanskrit word called Chakra. The irony of all these things is the data that the linguists used was entirely from Sanskrit, or most of it was from Sanskrit to reconstruct the Proto-Indo-European language. Then they turned around and made the PIE as fact and Sanskrit as a derived uh, language. You see the, uh, the problem over here in science, we can't make assumptions into facts, but that's exactly what they've done, uh, uh, turned around things and made it this way. Gives you an idea of that. And many people have called out the problem. One such rule was a Kenton Satan classification, where Kenton with a K or the C is 100 in Latin, and the Shatam in Sanskrit or Shatam in Avesta. So, People assume this Kentum Satan classification shows the migration routes. And they said Kentum is, is European and uh, Shatam is Asian. But we are seeing if this is Kentum is European, how come Tokarian, which is in the Tarim Basin, if you will, in China, how on earth are those people over there? They're not supposed to be Europeans. So we're seeing a problem over there. And we are seeing that uh, uh, Hittites are in Asia, but that's supposed to be uh, uh, not, not the same. Shatam is supposed to be Asian, but we're seeing in uh, Baltic countries, Slavic countries, these people are all following the Shatam kind of things. Finally, uh, Conrad Els calls out that uh, there's a proto-Bangani in the Himalayan region that uses Koto for 100. So that is, a, again, a Kentum classification. So linguistics has got rules that don't stand up to the uh, facts that exist out there. That is what I'm calling out by this particular failure of this model. All right, from that, we are now moving to a different period, uh, India and Europe, 3,000 to 1,500 years ago. I'm looking at the early Greeks over here. A lot of recorded contacts from at least 6th century time of Darius, 
uh, there are records of Greeks and Indians living in Persia. Skylax is supposed to have navigated the Indus in 509 BCE. And Circes, he led the Greece, uh, uh, an army against the Greeks, Athens in 480 BCE. There were divisions of Gandharians and Indians in that, uh, uh, in that army. And there are also various Greek thinkers and travelers to India, people like Pyron, uh, 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 Patroclus and uh, uh, other such people. This uh, uh, was a, a tweet that came out by an archaeologist called uh, Angela O'Brien just last year or so. So she shows in a museum in Athens how these arrowheads were recovered from the Battle of Athens going to 480 BCE. This is the same battle we're talking about. This steel in the Persia shows the different people who took part in the Persian army in the invasion of Greece. Among them are the Shaka, the Hindush, Gandharans. These are all the Indian parts of the contingent who went and fought in this battle. Library of Alexandria, we know that Eratosthenes, the chief librarian over here, set up by Ptolemy, third century BC, 40,000 works, important component of knowledge transmission to the West. And it was required that any birthing ship at the Mediterranean port had to part with their books for copying to the library, according to Galen, who was a Roman physician. And uh, many thinkers, Euclid, Archimedes, Eratosthenes, and the famous Hipparchus, Theon, and the unfortunate Hypatia, uh, Aristarchus, and others, they all use the resources of this library, and we are aware of, uh, uh, of this. Pythagoras, various people have called out that he went to India, Albert Burke uh, in 1901, A.N. Marlowe 1954, Apoll Apollinus of Tyna. They all say how he went to India, even learned the doctrine of transmigration. Indians believe in uh, vegetarianism, in karmic theory, reincarnation. So he seems to have gone back to Greece and become a vegetarian. And people called him a madman because he wouldn't eat meat. And he had a curriculum kind of school where he was the acharya or the teacher in charge and around him are the disciples ready to receive wisdom in the outer circle are the uh, disciples coming in very interesting to see that there are connections between pythagoras and indian music i've called it out earlier pythagoras is the father of western music he used something called string ratios to define the frequencies between notes in india silver sutras was mathematics done with strings Samaveda shows three notes. Three is sacred for Pythagoras. The three by two ratio is the starting point for the scales. In Samaveda, we got the Swara system of seven notes and the diatonic music of Pythagoras is seven notes. India, we got from 22 Shrutis, mentioned the Chandogya Upanishad, we get the 12 semitones and the seven Swaras. In the Western tradition, seven, 12 semitones to seven notes. Swaras were associated with divinities. Music was used for Samaveda chanting initially. Pythagoras too considered music as holy and spiritual. In India, Saraswati is a pattern of uh, 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 learning and music. And in uh, 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 Pythagoras, he erected a statue for muses, a female divinity for music. Very interesting to see these kind of parallels. Democritus, Cicero, as well as Trabos, mentioned that Democritus visited India. And uh, uh, very interestingly, he seems to have echoed the ideas in Vaisheshika Sutra of Rishi Kannada. So he says he's referred to in the West as the father of science, where uh, um, he's talking about solidness of material, atomic theory, and other such things, the kinds of atoms, and so on. If you look at uh, Rishi Kannada, who I put to 2000 BC, you'll wonder why I've done that. Well, Buddhism mentions Vaisheshika, but Vaisheshika does not mention Buddhism. So he predates Buddhism. In the Indian tradition, the Buddha is dated to 1800 BCE. So I put him prior to that in 2000 BCE. In Vaisheshika Sutra, he had talked about the natural world, about atomic theory, about the particularity of substances like color, taste, touch, and so on. Democritus says the same thing. He says that creation is made up of atoms, two kinds of knowing, legitimate with intellect, illegitimate with sense objects, exactly the same as Vaisheshika in terms of epistemology. It's the same thing. We are also seeing that the Indian medical practice, Ayurveda, with uh, Tridosha, Tridosha meaning three qualities, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, along with five elements, ether, air, fire, water, earth, along with the elements, cold, uh, uh, cohesion, light, and so on. This is mapped into the humor system by Hippocrates, 
with yellow blood, uh, phlegm, and uh, this one, hot, dry, cold, and so on. Who was Hippocrates? He was a student of Democritus, who was internalized from India and come here. There were Buddhist transmissions in this time frame, the spreading Indian thought. The Indo-Greek contacts from Alexander from 330 BCE, who also ordered translation of works for his teacher, Aristotle. And we talked to the Library of Alexandria. So very clearly, we are seeing transmission of uh, uh, a whole lot of knowledge systems over here. And after Alexander, we're seeing Seleucid Empire all the way from today's Pakistan till the Mediterranean lands, the Seleucid Empire forming a conduit where Mauryan Empire could exchange knowledge over here and uh, many other things. Let me uh, jump. I'm not going to talk about Hipparchus. Eratosthenes, very interesting. We talked about him earlier. He was a librarian at Alexandria. Very uh, interesting works. I'd like to talk about Clemens of Alexandria, who was an early Christian father who let a lot of writings. This is from early Christian writings. So he says, Plato does not deny he procured all that is excellent in philosophy from the barbarians. He admits he came into in Egypt and is talking about how they honor their gurus, law, lawgivers and teachers, designating them as gods and so on. And he's talking about Brahmins, he's talking about uh, various other things over here, Pythagoras also, who's learned from Indians, the Brahmins and so on. Very interesting to see this. If you look at the epistemology of the Greeks, now the Greeks philosophies from Socrates, from Plato and Aristotle, and Socrates didn't leave much writing, but his student uh, Plato wrote a lot, right? So he compensated for that. So we are seeing in Plato's writing three sources of knowledge. Knowledge obtained from senses is not a true knowledge, but he says knowledge from mind or wisdom that is a much better quality of knowledge. This is exactly why Sheshika, that Rishi Kanada has said much, much earlier, that there are two kinds of inference and perception, two kinds of perception, one with the sense objects which can be fooled, and the other through the mind or intellect is a superior form of knowledge. That is a code that we're seeing in the Greek epistemology, and all the schools that followed uh, later on from the Greek traditions have this. We're also seeing a strange situation where there are many, many Greek historians who write in India, but in India, you don't have a single historian or writer who references the Greeks, except Varahamera, who calls reference to the Yavanas. You don't find that uh, elsewhere in India. So very, very interesting to see that. So in an earlier talk, I've talked about the out of India transmission 3000 BC to present. I've shown how 3000 BCE we had from Sumeria into, from India into Sumeria transmissions over here. 2000 BCE with the monsoon failure to the fertile crescent. Then we are seeing from the fertile crescent, the Hittites took knowledge to the Minoans. That's how this knowledge went over there. Then many other transmissions, the Indo-Roman trade, the, uh, the Armenian Syrian kind of trade, then the Islamic transmissions to these Spain and other places, Sicily and Spain, and from there on into Western Europe, the colonial transmissions. Very, very interesting. There's no time. There's an entire one hour stock right over here. I'll go to a later period. This is a little contentious. I apologize if some of you are offended by this, but 2000 years ago to 800 years ago on the Christianity. So Christianity was impacted by Neoplatonism. So we're seeing that uh, uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle were greatly influenced by Pythagoras, who we are seeing the transmission of ideas. Influence of Upanishad is clearly there on their philosophy. They followed the Gurukulam style of teaching. And we also have this historical figure called Ammonia Sakar, the third century, who was an Indian philosopher or yogi settled in Greece, who reconciled Plato, Aristotelian philosophies in accordance with Indian philosophies. His greatest student was Plotinus, who founded Neoplatonism school, where the substantial influence of Vedanta, the one or Brahman, and that believes in reincarnation, philosophical contemplation, similar with Samadhi, perfection, and so on. This greatly influenced both Augustine and Aquinas, who were great theologians in the Christian faith. And we're seeing the theological DNA itself, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, you can, we can call this the, the old uh, uh, Platoism, if you will. And from Ammonius Saka, his students are Plotinus and Origen, and they, uh, uh, they, they were uh, the new Platoism, if you will. And we are, we are seeing that uh, both of them had great impact on uh, early Christianity through the writings. And we are seeing Neoplatonists Neoplato is, uh, over here, Ammonia Saka, Origen, uh, uh, Porphyry, this, this person, St. Justin, Augustine, many, many people in, over this timeline, we are seeing them. And in uh, Plotinus' work, 
we are seeing from the one emanation to uh, 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 intellect, if you will, from their emanation to body, soul, matter, individual soul, sensible world, and then an evolution, if you will, path of knowledge, you go to intellect and the one. This is a recasting of Vedanta, if you will. And uh, this, this is an idea that uh, was folded into Christianity too. In the Indian context in Vedanta, we are seeing the manas, buddhi, ahankara, awareness, something called antakarana, where this is the emanation, if you will, from pure awareness to the intellect, where you have discriminatory reasoning faculties, from there to the uh, development of an ego or the self-proclaimed identity, from there to faculty driven by emotions of like, dislike, and things like that. And if you were to conquer that through yoga, you have an evolution path to Atman, where you overcome your likes, dislikes, you overcome your ego, you overcome, you understand all of these things, and you become aware of Brahman or the pure intelligence. So this is a similar idea over there. In Puritanical Christianity, we are seeing a similar kind of uh, 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 emanation and aspiration from God, Christ, church to religious, spiritual faith, the inv invisible spiritual world, on to visible, tangible world is over here. With ascension, you get back over here. Similar kind of idea in Neoplatoism. We already talked about that. More intriguing to me is the mudras. We have a lot of archaeological evidence or art evidence, if you will, over here, which talks about mudras. Mudras are hand gestures. Even today, if you see a Bharatanatyam dancer, she'll be doing various gestures with her hands, which have got deep meaning, philosophical meaning in the Indian context. It requires a PhD to understand many of these things. But uh, I'd like to show you something. This is from the work of Bibudev Mishra. And uh, this mudra where you hold the fold, the third finger with your thumb is called a Prithvi Mudra. It is used for uh, uh, balance the earth, promotes healing, spiritual balance. And we are seeing in Byzantine iconography in Moscow, Christ is holding that. Christ is associated with healing. He heals, right? And he's holding the Prithvi Mudra. Very, very strange over here. And we are seeing the Prana Mudra. When you do this, it is a prana mudra, increases the vitality, and uh, it comes from, the, from this one, increase the kapha. This is related to Ayurveda over here. And we are seeing again in uh, in Mount Sinai, Byzantine iconography, St. Catherine's Monastery, Christ holding the prana mudra. And this is the apana mudra, where the middle fingers are down and this is up. It's a purification mudra. And we are seeing in Russian Orthodox iconography in an Amsterdam museum, we are seeing this uh, mudra over here. The Karana Mudra, the Karana Mudra dispels negativity, anxiety, fear, depression, and so on. And we're seeing Pope Francis who's making this hand gesture. He might not have known it, but that is the gesture that he's showing over there. The Shuni Mudra, so this one decreases the space, uh, space element in the body, is a therapeutic mudra, again, healing properties. And in Greece, we are seeing Christ holding this uh, Shuni Mudra. The Dhyana Mudra, and Dhyana is used by yogis for meditation to improve the uh, body's concentration and healing. And in this Brazil collection, we're seeing Jesus in a uh, Dhyana Mudra over here. Surya Mudra, which is, uh, uh, is folding down this finger, holding the thumb over it, increases the fire element and eliminates the earth element. And we are seeing this in Turkey, Byzantine fresco. You're seeing this uh, figure holding this mudra in both the hands over here. Anjali Mudra, which is a namaste which you're familiar with for spirituality and meditation. You're seeing that an assumption of Mary in the Vatican, she's holding this uh, namaste mudra. Abhaya Mudra. Abhaya Mudra is a, a gesture of fearlessness, like God says, I'll protect you, don't be afraid. Uh, that kind of uh, gesture, which Buddha has also shown this Abhaya Mudra. And you're seeing that in uh, uh, St. Francis of Azizi in the Lourdes Museum, is showing that uh, don't be afraid kind of thing. And we have this Abhaya Mudra and Varada Mudra. Once again, uh, this if you hold your hand up, it is protection. If you hold your hand down, like the uh, goddess is doing, she's giving, she's, uh, uh, she bestows gifts. And you're seeing this kind of uh, bestowing of a gift as well as this protection mudra over here. And you're seeing this Arthapataka Mudra over here, which is uh, symbolizes this air, space, fire, light movement. And this mosaic in Italy is showing Christ holding this Arthapataka Mudra. 
From that, I'd like to go to yogic experiences. Very, very intriguingly, the famous theologians of Christianity, one of them is Augustine of Hippo. He was first a money chain who followed the prophet money, and then he became a Neoplatoist. Then he became a Christian. He underwent yogic trance, and he recounted that as a mystic experience in his writings. We know that in yoga, you can go to a state where you become unaware of your surroundings, you have yogic bliss, if you will. Aquinas, very famous Catholic theologian. So he wrote this famous Summa Logica, and he left it incomplete. He left it incomplete because he said, I have experienced something so great, so beyond everything. It is meaningless for me to continue this work anymore. That's exactly what he left. And he is supposed to have uh, experienced uh, yogic uh, experience, aware of the practices and so on. Very interesting to see that. A lot of influences from Vedanta. I'm not going to read these things. There are many people who have done this. For example, in Bhagavad Gita, I destroy the darkness born of ignorance, shining light of wisdom. Bhagavan Krishna saying that. I am the light of the world who follows me will not be in darkness. We see in John chapter 8. I am the origin of the whole world and its dissolution, beginning, middle, end. Krishna, I am the Alpha, Omega, first and last, beginning and end in Revelation. And you're seeing the whole universe came from Brahm, Brahman, moves in Brahman, Katha Upanishad. And you're saying, yet God is not far from each of us. In him we live, move, have or be in acts. Similarly, there are many, many. Go for it, you'll find it. Seek and ye shall find. That is what we see over here looking at uh, Christian literature and uh, Hindu literature. So many parallels over there. All right, from there, I'll go to uh, uh, early trade slice, both sea and land-based, India and Europe from 2,500 to 1,000 years ago. Famous Periplus of Eritrean Sea from 100 BC to 400 current era talks about the ports in India where uh, Roman sailors could trade. They would come from Mediterranean lands to Alexandria, where the ships would stop. They would take the land caravan here. And in the Red Sea, there would be Indian ships waiting for them with favorable monsoon winds. And from that, Indian ships would take them to these ports over here and here. When the winds are favorable, they go back with goods and cross the land caravan and go back to Mediterranean ports. So this was the way trade was done in the uh, ancient days in many, many things. Many artifacts are found even today. This just happened three or four months back where there's news of archaeological finds in Bereniki in Egypt showing some, uh, uh, some Brahmi scripts as well as Buddha's uh, statues and so on. Those were found in this place. The famous Pompeii Lakshmi. So this uh, uh, ivory statue was found in Pompeii, which we know was destroyed in a volcanic eruption in 79 current era. It originated in Maharashtra, in Satavahana Empire. It exemplifies the Indo-Roman trade at that uh, particular time. Dioscorides, who was he? He was a Greek physician, 50 to 70 current era. He wrote a five-volume work called Materia Medica. And that work has got many, many Indian herbs, recipes of drugs. This is used as medicine for 16 centuries in Europe. And for example, this one is the uh, Malabar uh, tree uh, from Malabar, various things. These are all Indian uh, uh, um, uh, herbs that is discussing and why it can be used. Very interesting to see that. In Southern India, there's a place called Arikameda, which is there in Periplus of Eritrean, uh, Eritrean Sea. And uh, this has been excavated and found to be a Roman trading place. Earlier this year, in Twitter, the Israel Antiquities Authority, they excavated a garbage dump. Yes, you heard me right, a prehistoric garbage dump. They wanted to find these early caravan people when they dumped their goods, what were the kind of things that they had. And they found various swatches of cotton cloth, which is from India on a Silk Road about 1300 years ago. I found it amazing because this could easily pass off as modern uh, styles and so on. But this is the kind of workmanship that probably existed in that time. There was also an overland uh, trade route, the Silk Road. The Silk Road connected India, China, uh, uh, Central Asia, Mediterranean land, Southeast uh, uh, Asia through various trade networks. Indian knowledge is also part of this uh, trade network. We know that. Transmission in early medieval times, they talked about Dioscorides. Uh, uh, the, and we also talked about the Roman trade. 
Byzantine emperor, he persecuted people called Nestorians who fled to Kerala, became the Syrian Christians there, and they were a source of transmission to Syria. They also went to Jundi Shapur in Persia. The Greeks, the Greek philosophers, so-called pagans in Byzantine uh, Greece, as well as Nestorians, and they practiced medicine there with the Indians. And pre-Islamic Persia, this Anushiruvan, one of their most famous kings, because he was just, he sent his physician to India to get uh, uh, medical texts. And this is the academy at uh, Jundi Shapur that is practicing medicine for a long time. There was also a Jewish presence in Kerala. So the Jewish presence has been tracked back to a pretty ancient period of time. The first Jews landed at the time of King Solomon himself. And there are various Old Testament accounts that are referencing goods from India, in uh, uh, from peacocks, apes, and other such things. And the Romans, when they destroyed the second temple in Jerusalem, that led to a further uh, uh, wave of immigrants who landed up in Kerala in 70 current era. There have been copper inscriptions found in some synagogues in Kerala that show the Indian kings granting them lands and uh, sanctuary to stay in uh, Indian lands at that time. Also, when the Inquisition was going on in Spain, after the Reconquista in Spain, they underwent uh, Inquisition where they were ridding the society of the Moors, the Jews and others. Many of the Jews fled and settled in India. Why India? Because they were all part of the trade route. The Jews were also part of the finances of the trade route, so on. They were intimately familiar with the uh, routes to India, to Kerala and so on. So they landed up there. They were called Pardesi or the white Jews. But after Israel came into existence, most of them have migrated out into Israel today. Who were the Nestorians, today's Kerala Syrian Christians? So they were people who were persecuted in Byzantine uh, uh, Christianity because of their uh, uh, understanding of what was Christ. Was he human? Was he a God, divinity, or so on, based on Mary and so on? They were called heretical at this council and the second council, and his followers fled to Persia, Kerala, and they maintained connection to Edessa. Edessa, now we got to see where Edessa is, and that is in Syria, obviously. Antioch, Nisibis, Edessa were all learning centers. Part of Seleucid Empire was trading with India and then Parthian Empire. So their merchants had long trade relations with Kerala, Tamil Nadu. They were also instrumental in taking knowledge and translating that in Baghdad, in the Baghdad House of Wisdom to Arabic. And one uh, uh, not noteworthy point is from the bishop called Severus Sebat. So he is criticizing the Greeks. The Greeks were snobs who thought they had great wisdom and so on. So he's saying, you know, there are people called the Hindus, not the same as Syrians. Their discoveries in astronomy are much more ingenious than Greeks of their calculation. And he wished to say that by means of if you, those who believe because they speak Greek, they've reached the limits of science, should know that there are others also who know something. It's a subtle rebuke to the Greeks who think they are civilized because they speak Greek and nobody else is civilized. He's saying there are others too who do this. But for us, it's a data point that says, yes, Indian knowledge has reached this place in that time. Armenia, a lot of evidence of ancient contact. There's an Indian community living in Armenia in the 5th century BCE. Alexander's army that had Armenians who showed him how to go to India because they were part of the trade route. That's how we landed up in Balochistan and other places. Xenophon says Armenians knew Indian economic life, political geography, and so on. This theologist, he refers to Hindu language as musical. There's a trader called Thomas Kana who sought sanctuary in Malabar coast, probably fleeing the Islamists. And uh, his followers are the Kanayan uh, uh, Christians today in India and a guidebook to Indian cities in the 12th century. And uh, many of the towns were important centers of trading with India and gems and other such things. In 1688, Armenian merchants also helped the British find their way to India. Not only the Alexander's army, they also helped the British find the land route to India. And they were granted the status of free citizens of England. Akbar, who was a Mughal, he married an Armenian woman and he had a doctor too. Today, there are many communities in India, Kul Kolkata, Chennai, Mumbai, Agra. You can go and find uh, Armenian churches that started in 15th century itself. All right, one more slice. I'm going now to later and closer and closer to our times. 1300 to 50 or 500 years ago, uh, Muslims were an intermediary transmission to Europe. 
and we have evidence once the Muslims attacked India in Sindh especially, a lot of Indian texts found their way to Baghdad along with Indian translators. So we have the greatest scientists of uh, Islamic world, Al-Fazali, Al-Kindi, Ibn Sina, they all reference the works that were brought from India and translated into uh, uh, Persian and Arabic, whether it was mathematics, astronomy, medicine, and so on, all these things came from here. And we have uh, uh, the famous Baghdad House of Wisdom set by Caliph Harun al-Rashid, and that was meant as a place where they'll translate Sanskrit, Greek, Syriac works into Arabic, works of Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Shushruta, Charaka, Aryabhata, all these things were done here. But uh, uh, this, this was used by many of the Islamic scholars. They would use this for philosophy, math, medicine. Unfortunately, destroyed by Mongols in, in this uh, uh, siege of Baghdad. But uh, this famous figure, uh, Al-Tusi, he rescued 400,000 manuscripts, which he took to Azerbaijan. And that formed an important conduit for knowledge transmission to Europe, later knowledge transmission to Europe. So Muslim transmissions, several of them, I'm not going to read this, but uh, you see my earlier talks, please. I've uh, recounted many of that. Many Muslim uh, uh, writers have talked about how they took Indian number systems uh, outside India to the Muslims, for example, in Tunisia, in North Africa, talking about Indian numbers. And we have uh, several more people uh, who are talking about Indian numbers. Medieval Europe also seems to have knowledge about Indian uh, knowledge. For example, Isidoris of Seville, he's talking about uh, Indian numbers. His knowledge came from the Islamic people. Leonardo of Pisa from Algeria, he got the knowledge of, of these things. Alexander de Ville is talking about Indian numbers. This rabbi over here, he's talking about Indian numbers. And Gerbert of Aurillac in Thousand Current Era. So he, he later on became Pope Sylvester. So he learned uh, Hindu Arabic digits and developed the abascus and uh, to do computation. Leonardo Fibonacci, so his father was a trader in Algeria. So he traveled with him as a young boy and learned these things from the Muslim merchants. And he wrote about how to use Indian numbers uh, over here. So transmission was done in, uh, to Europe via the Muslims. Indian knowledge was injected in all the Muslim lands, the uh, Umayyad as well as the Abbasid Empire Caliphate, the, all of uh, uh, Persia, of, uh, of, 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 of Arabia, Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Spain. Spain was in the control of Muslims in those days. So Cordoba was an important place of learning over there. And we also know that there were uh, 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 people in uh, mo monasteries in Toledo, Christian monasteries whose job was to translate the Arabic text into Sanskrit. So Indian knowledge went to the Greeks and Romans, but was destroyed during Constantine and Christianity and the success of Theodosius, who destroyed all of pagan knowledge systems. But Greek knowledge remained in the Arab lands, in Levant, it remained in uh, Damascus, Beirut, other places. It was inherited by the Muslim Arabs. Indian knowledge also destructively obtained, was consolidated by them injected into Latin in translation schools in Toledo and Italy. And today it has come back to India, as well as travelers who took this knowledge directly to uh, Spain. I've talked about this in earlier, so I won't spend too much time. We know in Toledo, Raymond of Toledo, Gerard of Cremona, these people were uh, at the forefront of translating uh, Arabic literature. In Sicily also, which is under the control of Muslims in those days, there too, Arabic texts were translated into Latin. We have records of many people. This is an intriguing thing that I found from the British Library. This was released on Twitter about a couple of years back. So they said this is a 12th century illustrated manuscript from Britain that shows uh, uh, surgery, surgical procedures. When I saw that, I said, wow, this is exactly Shushruta's procedure. Shushruta, ancient Indian surgery person, who's talking about both hemorrhoid surgery, nasal growth surgery, cataract surgery. All these things were translated by Ibn Sena that went into Europe, translated in, uh, at the schools in Toledo, diffused into Europe. It has come to 12th century Britain where it has been popularized, technique has been popularized. Very, very interesting to see this. Similarly, numbers, I'm not going to go into detail about this. The subject of today's talk is not the exact uh, transmission. But just to show you contact, even Britain, in Britain, they were using Latin numbers, right? Can't do much with that. 
in uh, 1556, this person, Robert Record, wrote this book, Castle of Knowledge. Over here, he shows how to multiply two big numbers, 5541 times 5541 by shift and add. Again, multiply that with the same number to get this result. This is a scholar-master kind of dialogue. What you find in Upanishads, what you even find in Indian mathematician works like Bhaskara, Leelavati, and so on, that kind of a dialogue style is here, a literary style. All right, we are coming to even more closer times. India and Euro 500 years ago, the philosopher slides, the modern thought. So what exactly is this modern thought? I have borrowed these slides from uh, this Dr. Budi Hadima. We, we, when we talk about Western philosophy, we talk about metaphysics, existence, epistemology, axiology, logic, ethics, a whole lot of things are referenced over here. But we know historically there was cosmocentrism in the Greeks who thought about the creation of the world and their position in it. Then it went on to Christianity, theocentrism is the will of God, don't question, that kind of a thing. Then after the Renaissance period, it went to anthropocentrism, the modern thought, and today with uh, symbolism, logocentrism, postmodernism. So this is the uh, various schools that existed. And many, many people, rationalism with Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Pascal, empiricism, criticism, Kant, and idealism. And we know about these things, right? I studied uh, many of these people's works between 1600s and 1900s. Interesting to me to see the impact of Vedanta on uh, Western philosophy. This is from this work by American Vedantas. So we are seeing that uh, initially Western culture traces origin on ancient Greeks, who had idolized the Brahmins of India in their writings. We're seeing, we already talked about that. Pythagorean doctrine derived from Vedic tradition. We know about that. The Republic uh, concept in uh, Plato, it's an adaptation of Indian Manuspriti, uh, the ideal of uh, Ra Rajashri, the, how kings should behave. Aristotle's first cause, Anmod Mover, has a parallel in Samkhya philosophy of Purusha. Herodotus, he's citing Sanskrit grammar throughout in his uh, acquaintance as Ashtadhyayi of India. So the Renaissance and Enlightenment period was informed by Greek ideas, political liberty, man as measure of things, control of environment. Ancient Greece was illuminated by light from the East. Immanuel Kant collected uh, information about India from travel books. Voltaire wrote, I'm convinced everything has come down to us from the banks of Ganga. If you look at Descartes or René over here, he, he is incorrectly credited with algebraic geometry, but let's leave that aside but his famous for I think, therefore I am. He was exposed to Plato, Aristotle, works of Democritus during his works. And in his epistemology, he's discarding perception as unreliable, admitting only deduction and reason as valid. This is exactly Vaisheshika. That is what we are seeing over here. He resurrected atomic theory of Democritus, which is again Vaisheshika over here. Spinoza, all of us know, is the most important philosopher in, in Enlightenment, covering many, many areas. And uh, the strange thing is he was excommunicated from Judaism because of his thinking. And if you see the 19th century uh, German Sanskritist Theodore Goldstrucker, he's noticing the similarities between Spinoza's religious conceptions and Vedanta tradition. He's saying Max Müller, in addition, he also says, there is striking similarity between Vedanta and the system of Spinoza. And the same thing, Helen Blavatsky, who is a theosophical society, she's talking about the same thing. So we're seeing there is impact of Vedanta in uh, Enlightenment thought. Voltaire, well, we know he was pretty critical of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, a practice of slavery, he saw Vedanta as superior, noble, and shaming immorality of Christian, of uh, European imperialists, and so on. So he clearly, his, his thinking also influenced many generations of the elite and thinkers. So from there, we go to the final slides over here, colonial slides, when the notion of India as we know it in ancient, modern, pre-modern times was utterly destroyed. So this is the 300 years to the present time. So many sea voyages took, part, uh, took place to India after the fall of Constantinople to the Islamic people, which locked Europe out of land trade. So the discovery doctrine, which was promoted by the Catholic Church, that gave Europeans rights to claim lands during their explorations. So the papal bull was issued to divide the world into two regions of exploration, for Portugal and Spain, where Spain could keep the Americas and Portugal could keep all of these things in Asia and so on. 
Portugal commissioned Vasco da Gama to uh, sail around Africa, reached India. Soon they were followed by the Dutch, French, English, and the letter colonization. Three waves of colonization. The first wave, Portugal, Spain, colonized America, Africa, India. The colonial loot of Portugal and Spain, that attracted Britain, France, and uh, Netherlands. They colonized uh, Caribbean and North America. The second wave saw Britain and India, East India Company, France, Portuguese, uh, Dutch in, in Asia. The third wave was a so-called Berlin Conference, a scramble for Africa, where these European powers divided Africa for themselves, Britain, France, Germany, Portugal, Belgium, and other, other people. In 1945, this is the state of the world, the colonizers and remaining colonization. One can see that a large part of the world is still uh, colonized or just got in the colonizers themselves. And we are seeing that uh, Europeans exalt a lot of things, father of science, father of medicine, enlightenment, renaissance, flowering of thought, and so on. But then there are perspectives that they are blind to. And I provide that perspective by saying enlightenment did not prevent colonization. White colonization uh, fueled by Christianity, immorality, and greed. We had three types, settler colonization in uh, US, Canada, Australia, South Africa, exploitation colonization, Asia and Africa, trade colonization, opium wars, opening of Japan, starting with the Portugal, Portugal and Spain, people blessing, and with the French and Dutch colonial empires, the British, and finally Africa itself. Enlightenment did not prevent captive markets. The onset of industrialization in Europe was accompanied by a deindustrialization of the colonies, as well as retaining the colonies as captive markets. So they saw the colonies ensure the mother country with cheap supply of raw materials, timber, sugar, tobacco, furs, and such things. And they also served as a captive market to finish goods. So that is what uh, the purpose of colony were. And we are fully aware from Europe to Americas, from Africa, similarly from Asia. India supplied cheap raw material labor. It was forced to buy expensively from British factories. Enlightenment did not prevent slavery, one of the biggest uh, issues in this time. Indentured slave, uh, servitude. Uh, British people shipped 2 million Indians as indentured laborers to 19 colonies to work on cotton, tobacco, sugarcane plantations in Fiji, Mauritius, in the West Indies, Trinidad, Tobago, in uh, uh, various other places, in Malaysia and so on. And uh, Atlantic slave trade, uh, more than 12.5 million Africans shipped as slaves. We are aware of this uh, unfortunate history. And the impact of colonialism was terrible on India. I've just taken India as an example. For example, uh, the famines, 80 million Indians died as a result of British policies. And uh, we can call it out today under the heading of ethnocide. UNESCO says ethnocide is when a group is denied the right to enjoy, develop, transmit its culture and language individually or collectively. It's a massive form of human rights violation. The British orchestrated through five mechanisms in India. Creation of widespread poverty, destruction of identity through manufacturing what they called caste, destruction of identity through distorting history, destruction of religion through missionary activity, destruction of education system through the introduction of English. And Angus Madison, who was a historical economist, who was commissioned by the European uh, uh, Economic Council to try to see the impact of colonization, he made this graph. It's not a linear graph, mind you. So he's saying, if you go back to the year one of the common era, India, which is this uh, orange color, had one of the highest GDPs in the world that dropped down at the onset of colonization to uh, about 25% of the world GDP and a rapid decline in the fortune of India, where it had fallen to less than 4% of the world GDP, thanks to the British during which time Western Europe went through a transference of wealth from here to there, they went up over here. Very interesting. In my talks, I've said how widespread poverty was induced into India by the British. The Americans had something called a manifest destiny where they had the God-given right to go and take native lands for themselves. They had that. So the British wanted a piece of that action, but they were snobs, right? So they were sneering at the British, the Americans doing manifest destiny, but they themselves came up with something called doctrine of lapse. 
Dalhousie, where if they protect a, a, a Indian ruler and that Indian ruler dies without a son, the British will grab that land for themselves. Through that land grab, a lot of lands were grabbed, and one of them was Tanjavur in southern India, a very prosperous place where Hindus were taxing them at 15, 1.5%. That was a tax on the common man. But when the British, they took over this place through doctrine of lapse, the tax overnight became 56%. People could not afford to pay the tax. There was a serial collapse of economy in all classes of society. We saw, we, we see the artisans, the scholars, the, the, the landowners, everybody's land was confiscated. Then the British turned around and they gave the land to some landowners called uh, uh, zamindars and told them, look, you can keep the land, but 90% is ours, the produce, 10% you can keep it. So these landowners, what they did is, to maximize their revenue, they stopped growing food crops like rice and other things. They would grow cotton, opium, uh, indigo, and other non-food cash crops over here. That led to tremendous famines in India. 80 million people died. The British couldn't care less, including the hero of World War II, Churchill, who couldn't care less that Indians were dying of famine. Uh, so uh, we see that. Taxation and loot, that fueled the industrial revolution of Britain and Europe. At the same time, they prevented India from participating in the industrial revolution. Worse, India was de-industrialized by, uh, by inducing poverty. That is what we are seeing uh, in India. Will Durant was an American who wrote this book, Case for America. He was an eyewitness to this. So he says the British incurred a tremendous debt for Indians, 1792, the British incurred a debt of $35 million for India. When he left India in 1930, it was $3.5 billion exchange rate as of 1930. After this was World War II, when the India, British used India as a bank, using money from India, the people from India to fight the war, materials and so on. So the debt went up tremendously. And Utsa Patnaik, who's a Marxist historian in India, she wrote a thesis recently, 2018, that the British Raj siphoned $45 trillion, today's dollar worth, between 1765 to 1938. That's the amount of money that was taken from India. The other, so that was poverty. Then the conception of caste, the anthropologists of that time used discredited metrics to create what they called as caste. India had a fluid system called Jati, Varna, Kulam, Gotra. This is perverted into what they call caste. This is, uh, this is uh, treated well in these two books, Nicholas and Dirk's book and Raji Malhotra's books. They talk about that. Education system. So Dharampa talks about what was education like before the British came and after. India was a highly literate society before the British came. After that, it was completely destroyed when they came with the British education system. Distortion of history. I've talked about the colonial Eurocentric distortion already. Ethnocide, conversion. We had literally dark ages of Western coast of India, Southern India, Northeast India, forced conversions, murders, torture. The, there was also inquisition in Goa at the time when inquisitions were going on in Spain, they had inquisitions in India, destruction of temples, persecution, demonization, impoverishment, denial of economic opportunities for Hindus, harassment, ranging from every strain, Portuguese, Catholics, German, Dutch, Lutherans, British, American, Baptist, Mormons, every shade of church is uh, complicit in this uh, uh, ethnocide. Destruction of identity of Indians that carries on to the present day itself. And today we are also seeing a parochial growth of knowledge. This ensures the impoverishment of formerly colonized countries. We have seen the history of the world in World War I, World War II, the pangs of German nationhood and impact on technologies, various technologies in service of the war effort. Then the ensuing Marshall Plan from USA which selectively rebuilt Europe, weapons, aircraft, engine space, then the onset of the Cold War, during which the NATO Pact, Warsaw Pact, parochial spread of knowledge, denying others the technology, where technologies like atom, uh, uh, aircraft, weapons, space, medicine, electronics. We see USA becoming a dominated, uh, domination and world destination of universities research, use of sanctions as foreign policy, spin-offs and BLSI, and uh, personal computer, DARPA, Usenet, human genome, CRISPR technologies. 
And today, with globalization, we have other things, climate change, decline of meritocracy, and many other challenges. So what we are seeing is the West took a jump start during the industrialization phase because of the loot from the colonies, which were impoverished. And from that jumpstart position and denial of opportunities, they have catapulted into the next few phases of industrialization and enrichment. Whereas you see uh, formerly colonized countries continue to suffer, whether it's in Africa, Asia, and so on. Today, biggest issue, climate change, global warming. We are seeing that uh, tremendous change is taking place since we have started to keep records. The family of hockey stick, which some people dispute, some people swear by it. But we had 15,000 scientists who swore by this in 2017, saying all these metrics that show the quality of life in one way or the other, ozone depleter, depletion, freshwater depletion, dead zones in the sea, forest cover, species, temperature change, everything is showing negative indicators. And their recommendations was promote a dietary shift towards plant-based foods and reduce the fertility rates that might say where we're going. Anyway, we are seeing a Holocene extinction going on where massive species uh, extinction is continuing today. And sorry, it took a tremendously long time, but in conclusion, what I tried to show here is a shared history of India and Europe over the ages, though our textbooks would not show this, trying to maintain a distance between the two. DNA studies show out of Africa, out of India, more than 60,000 years ago. After the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, there have been attempts to trace human activity using DNA and cultural finds. We have seen that Europe was populated by a mix of ANA, Caucasus hunter-gatherer, Eastern, Western hunter-gatherer, Eastern farmer, 20 to 10,000 years ago. We saw the onset of blonde hair and light pigment. Worldwide common archaeology, the dolmen, stone circle, menhirs, the shaman culture. We saw the onset of Neolithic agriculture from the East, 12,000 years onwards, impact on culture impact on early religion, on the common Indo-European deities traced back Rig Veda 10,000 years ago, saw some artifacts with Indic content. Then we went to the linguistic model and saw the failure to account for where did this ancestral language originate? Was it in Central Asia or could it have been elsewhere? Unfortunately, this failed model is upheld in academia even today. We saw early knowledge transfers to the Greeks, the philosopher tradition of the ancient Greeks, we saw the Vedanta and Christianity. We saw sea and land-based trade links, India and Europe. Muslim intermediaries between India and Europe, knowledge transmission all through the 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, leading to the so-called Renaissance and uh, Reformation. We saw after that when people, the, the philosophers over there were able to uh, ramp up with their ideas of challenging orthodoxy and trying to uh, make a different world based on reasoning, based on perception and inference, which is Vaisheshika. We saw colonization, how it destroyed India. And I think the uh, takeaway today is we need to reevaluate the values that have been programmed into us, thanks to media, academia, foreign policies, and figure out our joint futures based on mutual respect for all life. Okay, with that, I will stop sharing. I think I've taken uh, about two hours. Uh, so Matt, uh, <laughs> I apologize, it took so long, but the material is so expensive, even then I've had to race through much of it. Yeah, dude, no need to apology, uh, apologize whatsoever. And I'm, I'm glad that you provided such a comprehensive uh, brushstroke as, as I knew you would. And I, I mean, I, I think this is something that people have to revisit again and again. I have pages and pages of notes and I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna have pages more as I, as I reevaluate and revisit this class. Um, there is a question that came in from John. And uh, before that, though, I, I will just take the prerogative to, to pose uh, a question that, that was bubbling away. It's, it's, there's so many questions, but the one that I guess was the, the most pressing. Uh, towards the, the end of your, your talk, you, you mentioned ever so briefly the the fluidity of the, the uh, authentic caste structure, which is not really this. Per and then you described how the, the imperialists created a perversion of it, I, I suppose, in a more rigid way form that you're you're destined to be right. in that system right. and i know right. in the west when a lot of the imperialists that i've researched tend to see themselves in walking the model or the footsteps of plato 
and they use his um, a perversion of Plato's golden soul, silver soul, bronze soul dichotomy mm -hmm. in a very rigid, fixed way, as though your your blood defines your your virtue. Whereas Plato, when you read Plato, you could see that no, he sees it in a much more fluid way that everybody could become a golden soul if they're provided the 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 means of of enthusiasm, loving discovery, learning how their mind works. So I'm I'm curious, could you speak a bit more about how this this was perverted? I'm I'm guessing it's a similar thing in the Indian experience. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. So in the Indian tradition, we have something called Jati and Varna. In the context of this, we have two related concepts called uh, Kulam and Gotra, but let's leave that out. We'll just do Jati and Varna. Jati loosely is the occupation and Varna loosely is a disposition. What is your natural disposition? So in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, we have Krishna who's saying that uh, uh, your gunas determine what your Varna is. And gunas really mean disposition. Are you of something called, are you pulled towards a scholarly kind of uh, uh, disposition? Are you pulled towards a more worldly kind of uh, disposition or uh, different kinds of things? This is what is said in the Bhagavad Gita itself. It is not a birth based, but it's a disposition based Varna. Now, people of different Varnas could take up any jati that you want. Jati is an occupation. And we see that all the time where uh, some opportunities are not there for a livelihood. Uh, uh, for example, a Brahmin need not always be only a teacher or a priest. He could have been something else, maybe uh, a, a weaver or something like that. And we have seen that instances, especially in British time and so on. So uh, India had a fluid system. And how? where is the evidence for this fluid system? Evidence is there from Indian texts itself. For example, one of the sages that I talked about was Vishwamitra. Vishwamitra was in the Ramayana story, right? So he was supposed to be a Kshatriya. Kshatriya is a warrior, a warrior uh, disposition or a warrior varna. He became a Brahmin in the sense that because of his disposition, his learning, his scholarship, other things. So that was one instance of a mobility of a varna. Similarly, we have got uh, uh, a writer called Valmiki who wrote the Ramayana itself. Valmiki was of very humble origin. He was born with a union of a uh, um, fisherwoman. Fisherwoman, uh, sorry, I missed her. He was a robber. He was a robber in the forest. And he, his work is today revered as one of the greatest uh, religious texts in India, in Ramayana. The other author called uh, Vyasa. Vyasa was born of a fisherwoman who was supposed to be, in today's terms, we can call it a shudra. But then he wrote the Mahabharata, which is one of the most revered texts. The Bhagavad Gita comes in the Mahabharata, honored by all Indians everywhere. So we are seeing in ancient India itself, there are evidences of that. Coming to even more recent times, Aryabhata. Aryabhata was a scientist in mathematics and astronomy. And uh, his uh, naming is a name itself is controversial. Does his name have two T's or one T? If it is Aryabhata with two T's, that implies that he is of a high, uh, I wouldn't say high low, the, the hierarchy itself is bogus. The, he, he would be a Brahmin, one with access to knowledge. But then if it is one T, it's Bhatta, there's a different meaning in Sanskrit, then he is a servitude, he's like a servant, a server kind of a thing. So the American Sanskritist called Will, uh, Clark, I think it's William Clark, if I'm not mistaken, 1935, Harvard College, he wrote a translation of Arya Bhatia. You can Google for that and you can download that book. In the preface over there, William Clark is saying, what is the correct spelling? Is it two T's or one T? And he's clearly giving the arguments why it should be one T. He was not a Brahmin. It implies that he was of a serving class. This serving class person had access to the highest wisdom, which is astronomy and mathematics, used even today for Orthodox Hindu purposes. They use Aryabhata's formulas to do astronomy. So we have, even in recent times, come even closer to our own times. We have got a migrant community from the state of Maharashtra into Tamil Nadu called Saurashtra Brahmins. These Saurashtra people were weavers. Weavers are once again supposedly to be artisans. Artisans are all shudras. So they were, they became Brahmins when they came to Tamil Nadu because of the practices that they adopted. One more recent example in Maharashtra, we had the warrior community, uh, community. They were the Peshwas. But the Peshwas' origin is they were Brahmins, which means they were teachers and priests and things like that. But because of Islamic onset, they took up the sword. They took up the sword and they became Kshatriyas. 
they became Kshatriyas, warriors to fight. Shivaji comes in that tradition. And so they, they fought these people. So all over India, historically, in ancient works, we are seeing a mobility across the Varnas. How would one be mobile across the Varnas? By practicing the practices of that Varna. If I desire to become a person of a different Varna, there's something called uh, Saucha and Acharan. These are Sanskrit words. Acharam means practices. Saucha is cleanliness practices. So by following those practices, this entire community can become what they want to be. There is no upper, there is no lower over here. The British, they saw this when they wanted to make sense of the Jati Varna system. Their model was Kasta. Kasta was the European experience in the Americas. When in the Americas, they found that the white people are mixing with the native people there and mixing with the uh, slave, the black Africans over there, and these mixed races were coming, they did not know how they had to be handling the mosaic theory. Mosaic theory implies from Christianity that all the progeny that we see today are Noah's uh, progeny, right? After the great flood, God has created, destroyed everybody, and Noah's sons were Japheth, Shem, Ham, and it is from them that all of the progeny has come. Japheth is the father of the white races, and uh, Shem is the father of the Semitic races, and Ham is the father of all the colored races. So this is the thinking that Europeans had. And so to maintain that bloodline purity, why was it necessary? Because Ham's descendants were cursed in the Old Testament to serve the other uh, sons because Ham saw his father naked, right? So he was cursed to do that. So uh, because, because of these reasons, uh, they had to maintain this purity. But in the Americas, the people are mixing, how on earth do you figure out who is supposed to serve, who is not supposed to serve? So the notion of bloodline purity that the uh, Europeans had, that gave rise to casta. That casta served as a model to impose on India by the British. So this is what we are seeing. So additionally, uh, Additionally, when the British, there are a whole lot of records. There's a person called Abbe Dubior. He was a, a padre in uh, uh, who landed up in um, Tamil Nadu. He escaped the French Revolution. If he was there in France, his head would have been cut off in the guillotine. But he escaped, landed up in uh, India, and he continued searching the in India for uh, for for how to propagate Christianity. In doing so, he studied the practices of the different varnas. So he studied and documented what are the practices of the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, the Shudras. And he said, people with the highest number of purity practices should be considered as the highest caste. People with fewer purity practices are middle caste, lower caste. So this whole notion of hierarchy was his doing. There was no hierarchy in India. It was fluid. There's no upper, there's no lower, no such thing. So this, this hierarchy came because of their interventions. Their interventions led to that. So casteism came over there. This whole notion of uh, upper, lower came over there. This whole notion of uh, other things came there. I have written a paper. I also have uh, talks on this where I'm calling out attention to uh, um, community health. I'm calling out attention to community health. There, are, there is a talk of mine. I don't have the talk's title over here. I'll try to send it to you later, Matt. But do search for the talk. It is with the interlocutor called Esther. I think Esther just joined the talk too. Esther and myself, we have a talk uh, uh, that, that uh, handles this topic where I have said, Community health was primary in ancient times. Today, you don't care, right? Today, even if there's COVID, you practice social distancing and things like that. But we also have vaccines, so we are able to handle our uh, lives properly today. But during the peak of COVID, everybody was masking and uh, not touching and other such things. That's a template to take back in the earlier days when medical practice is not well developed. So Indians are aware of community health. I've given tremendous numbers of evidences for this. And I've shown how there's also knowledge of biohazards of each occupation. The weaver who practices in a tiny workshop with uh, cotton threads every day, breathing it in, he's got TB or pneumonia or exposure to these kind of uh, uh, pathogens. He gets immunity, his wife gets immunity, his children get immunity, his community gets immunity. Others may not have that immunity. The butcher in his workshop all the time chopping meat over there, he's exposed to E. coli, E. coli and other kind of bacteria. He gets some immunity. Similarly, the farmer works in, working the soil, corona complexes so there in the soil, he gets some immunity to that. Similarly, different professions. Indians were aware of biohazards. And so they practiced that 
then there's a town layout in this town these people will be in this area these people in this area these people in this area and so on the person who had the least immunity was the teacher the brahmin the brahmin did not have much physical activity he was required to eat simple foods not rich foods and things like that so his job was wake up in the morning you do uh, several prayers you recount uh, memory memory right so orally re, uh, recount the vedas and many other things till evening so the purity practices were maximum on the brahmin if you come in contact with somebody from this profession then you have to take one ritual bath or two ritual bath and things of this nature so the purity practices evolved according to the community in different ways and these were interpreted by this french catholic priest in terms of hierarchy so uh, in in a nutshell this is what you're seeing and further perversions happened when the british in their senses because they were controlling india they forced people to disclose what their caste was indians had no idea what it was there are enough number of british reports that say the converted christians and the muslims are declaring caste because they had no idea what caste was so it was their profession they were counting as caste and the british created 2000 castes especially this risley that i called out as herbert risley he was an anthropologist he was also the census commissioner of india 1901 or 18 late 1800s so he created 2500 or so subcastes and he ordered them based on social preference that was a example of his biases coming in over there in a hierarchy that they define so matt is a long answer but i uh, wanted to give you a rounded picture of how a fluid system got perverted by these imperialists into the what we call today as caste today this caste has been used to beat up indians everywhere whether it's in california today in california we have a law that has been a bill rather that has been called called sp403 if i'm not mistaken to uh, to demonize people based on caste we have in toronto we have got uh, uh, activities that are trying to bring in the so called notion of caste saying indians are practicing caste and so on utter nonsense even at a philosophical level vedanta is calling the oneness of everybody brahman brahman is oneness right our goal in life is to dispel our ignorance about our ego existence and who we are at a philosophical level of the civilization has invested so much in equality what kind of hypocrisy must exist so that people will practice this bigoted notion of caste that the british have imposed on us hmm. but this is conveniently used today to whack the uh, indian immigrants because of the economic successes they've had in the west this is used today you can read up on all the caste battles happening today even as we speak exceptional i and if, if you have not if you but if you could find a a copy or two of your writings or any other writings on this topic that uh, that i could follow up on or anybody could i i'm going to make that available happily in the description box of, the, of this video when it's made available on youtube um and i'm probably going to make your answer a, a standalone video cuz i just think it's so so wonderful uh, thank, thank you, you. Um John I know you've been waiting for a while. John Place are Hello, you still there? Uh, yes I'm here. Um thank you for the wonderful talk. Unfortunately I missed the first half hour because I didn't have the Zoom link. But um but the what I did see was impressive. I have two questions uh they're related. Um When we think of writing systems uh we think of the Middle East as the source of all writing systems but of course India has been using the various uh Brahmic scripts for uh, a long time um right. is, do you have a comment about uh, whether the Brahmic scripts are in fact much older than they're claimed to be that's the first sure, question sure. and the sure, second sure. and the second is Uh, John, um, please hold the thought. Um, John, please hold the thought. Uh, my okay. short-term memory is bad. I'm going to forget your second question. Okay. I'll take it after this. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, in the first question, the Brahmi script, and what can we talk talk about that? So, India had a script much earlier than Brahmi, and that's called the Harappa script. In Mohenjo-daro Harappa in the Indus Valley, there was a script that uh, uh, today's archaeologists try to put it uh, at a contemporaneous time frame as the Egyptian hieroglyphs. 
contemporaneous time frame or maybe slightly earlier than the cuneiform of the Sumerians. Uh, uh, but they also position that as an undeciphered, isolated script that has got no relevance to today. So this is the positioning of the Harappa script. In India, there have been researchers who have tried to see, is there a connection from the Harappa script to the later Brahmi script? Several people have done that. And I have called this at a call attention to this in my talks also. And some of them have shown, for example, Subhash Kak, by trying to show the frequency of the most commonly used Harappa signs and the most commonly used Brahmi signs, the 10 most common frequency based, he's showing one-to-one -one correspondences in the shape of the uh, script itself, in the shape of the things over there. Then there are people like Rajesh Rao, Professor Rajesh Rao, who are trying to see, is it a phonetic script or is it a logo script, a logogram kind of a script, Indus, I'm talking about Indus over here, or is it a what something else? So such kind of research has also been done. But the consensus among the people who have studied this appears to be that the Indus script could have evolved into the Brahmi script. We have a transitive Indus script in the transition between Indus to Brahmi that was found by an archaeologist called S.R. Rao. He found this in a place called Bait Dwaraka. Bait Dwaraka is an island of the uh, Gujarat coast. So over there in pottery shards, he found what is reference, referencing as a, transit, a transition between Indus to Brahmi. So that said, we have evidence of Brahmi script that has been used in India. For some time, it was thought the earliest Brahmi script evolves from uh, Ashokan time frame, an uh, emperor called Ashoka. And that emperor lived around 230 BCE or so. So because that is a time when you see Ashokan edicts and pillars in India written in Brahmi script. So they said it is from around that time. But newer archaeology has shown in southern India and elsewhere, there is earlier evidence of Brahmi script. For example, today in latest research from a place called Kuradi, this is in a place near Madurai, or from Adi Chanalu in Tamil Nadu, we have found that there is script, a Brahmi script going back to 600 BCE if not even earlier. So clearly, if you take Harappa, it is 3000 BCE. If you take uh, Brahmi by itself, it is around 600 BCE. If you take transitionary script in Bait Dwaraka, it is 1600 BCE. So we have this evidence in India of all of these scripts. How did the British address this? People like Gula, people like um, uh, several others. These are the early, early people who studied these works. How did they address it? So they saw that if you if you draw various scripts over here, the alphabets, if you will. So they saw Brahmi in the center over here. And on the right side, they said, Brahmi evolved into the various Indic scripts, whether it is Northern Indian script or Southern Indian script, or even um, Vietnamese script and other scripts are all influenced by, uh, uh, by, by, by uh, Brahmi. So they put all of those things to the right side. But to the left side, they have put, for example, what they reference to as a Phoenician script. Next to the Phoenician script is, uh, I'm trying to call, recall from memory, Phoenician script. I don't remember what the next one is. Maybe it is uh, Greek, eventually leading to English. So he's saying, hinting that it is from Phoenician script that Brahmi script has come. This is a Levant connection. So these people mm -hmm. believe strongly in Christianity. In Christianity, the word, the word is given by God. And from the God gave the written word to Moses in the commandments. So the word is pretty prominent over there. So the thinking is in the Semitic people are the ones who had the script initially. And from that, it has gone to other people. That thinking has percolated into imperialist thinking. It is colonial uh, people's thinking. And that we see such a recounting in Indian history on the scripts. Unfortunately, not much research, to my knowledge, has taken place on the Brahmi script, on the antiquity of that. We are only finding through archaeological finds in Tamil Nadu, for example. Then we have evidence of Pali in uh, uh, northern India, the script that is used for transmission of Buddhism to uh, China and other places, related scripts and such things. We have in Buddhist tradition itself that Buddha is supposed to have known a number of scripts in which Brahmi is one of them. If you then ask, what is the date of Buddha? That is highly contentious, right? Some people say Buddha is 400 BCE. Some people say, no, it's earlier. Then there were the people from Manchester who did uh, radiocarbon dating. They found uh, 
they found in Nepal, Lumbini, they found a Buddhist temple that should be dated to 540 BCE. How can there be a Buddhist temple before Buddha was born? So Buddha's state is being pushed back over there. Then in the traditional Buddhist account, if you go to Eastern Buddhism or Southern Buddhism, they have different ideas. Mongolian Buddhism places Buddha at about 1000 BCE. Amravati, which is Southern Buddhism, that places him to an even earlier time frame. The Puranas, which has got a chronology of Indian kings, that places Buddha to 1800 BCE. Around uh, 10 of, ten years ago, or uh, maybe a little earlier than, uh, later than that, in Manchester, a team of archaeologists did carbon dating at a temple in Lubini. They collected samples from a number of locations. The oldest carbon dating they've done, rather the oldest sample they got, hold your breath, is 1600 BCE. 1600 BCE. This paper is available on Google. You can search for carbon dating in Lumbini. Uh, Manchester, I think it's Manchester, you'll find the, the report, the report, the tables, you'll find all that over there. They brushed it away as that is cultural remains of an earlier temple over there because they're trying to find uh, um, um, uh, consonance with their uh, theories. So, but mm -hmm. I've got a problem because why should I accept that where my own tradition says, Purana say, 1800 BC is a consistent time frame for Buddha. So if Buddha mm -hmm. knew uh, Brahmi's script, what should we think of Brahmi's age? So there are several data points that come out from tradition and trying to uh, resolve inconsistencies and so on. So I would think that Brahmi is much older than our archaeological find of 600 BCE. And it is okay. derived from uh, from, from uh, Indus script. So this, this, this uh, actually, your answer was far greater far more detailed than I expected. And it wouldn't surprise me that the Harappan script was in fact uh, uh, phonetic, uh, just like the Mayan script turned out to be by the famous uh, Soviet uh, uh, decipher. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, and And... Um, and it, it wouldn't surprise me as well that it would actually be the uh, the, uh, the most ancient and known ancestor of the Brahmi script. But this moves naturally into my second question, which is, when the Spaniards went to Mexico, ultimately a Dominican monk destroyed most of the Mayan uh, right. libraries, oh, the, the collections right. that they had. Uh, when mm -hmm. the... Uh, when, with the initial uh, Islamic expansion into Persia, all huge numbers of libraries were also destroyed. Uh, the, the early Christian uh, mobs uh, destroyed the uh, library in Alexandria. Um, how much of ancient India's libraries, or I don't know what they're called in the temples and other places, have been preserved? Good question. Very good question. So uh, it's, a, it's not a happy answer. So India had an intellectual tradition that was oral. For a very long time, it was an oral tradition where uh, a huge amounts of information are committed to the mind. We have two classes of literature. One is called Shruti, other is called Smriti. Shruti is that which is um, heard. Smriti is that which is remembered. So the heard is an oral tradition. The remembered is probably a written tradition because the writing should recount in your mind what that stands for. So that, that kind of a remembered tradition. So two classes of literature. So the uh, later the medical, the astronomical, mathematical content appears to be the uh, Smriti literature. And the earlier philosophical works were in this uh, Shruti literature. Once writing was there, uh, uh, we know that Indians wrote on palm leaves. Indians did not have access to uh, clay soil the way the, uh, the, the cuneiform was or papyrus the way the Egyptians made paper. So Indians had perishable media. This perishable media is uh, recounted by a number of people. For example, in the work called Shatapatha Brahmana by Agnavalkya, he is referencing writing on cotton cloth. And Strabo himself says Indians wrote on cotton cloth and things of this nature. So a lot of perishable things are there. The Arabs say Indians wrote on dust, the numbers. That's why it's called Al-Gobar. Gobar means dust in uh, Arabic. So they said the Indian numbers are called Al-Gobar. They're writing in dust. 
So Indians, unfortunately, wrote on perishable media. The life of a palm script is about 600 years. India also had an intellectual tradition that every year during a certain festival, the families that maintained those palm leaves would write fresh palm leaves and burn the old ones. So we had that tradition also, so that uh, you have a continuing tradition uh, for a long time. Starting with Islamic uh, uh, attacks, many of these libraries were uh, uh, destroyed. For example, at Nalanda. Nalanda was a university in Bihar where we had some, maybe the first university in the world which had tremendous collection of works. And the uh, um, invader called uh, Bhaktiar Kilji, he came there, he repeatedly asked the monks over there, do you have the Quran over here? And they said, no, we don't have, we don't even know what Quran is. And he asked them that, is there any Muslim student here? They said, there are no Muslim students here. Then he reportedly said, there's nothing here that is of any value. And he ordered the destruction and burning of that library. And by their accounts, the library burned for about three months, a smoldering for around three months. That tells you the number of works that were there and were destroyed. So that is one instance. We have many other instances of universities in India that are destroyed during Islamic invasions, during which books were forcibly taken. Some of the Islamic people knew the value of the books. And we know that books were taken to Persia, to Baghdad, where they were translated into Arabic and transmitted into Western Europe. We know that also. So, like I said, unfortunate story because for continuing reasons, for a long time with British impoverishment, Indians could not preserve some of the uh, palm leaves that they had. So we had situations where families were forced to keep palm leaves in steel almaras for protection. Nothing more than that, no humidity control, no uh, any such control because poverty did not have any more resources, right? So those became worm eaten. We have instances where libraries could not maintain their works, all those kind of things. Now, in more recent times, we got uh, microfilming has been done, photographing has been done, digitization has been done, but there's a long way to go still. So a lot of works are still being lost. Even as we speak, works have been lost. Then I also encountered um, a professor in Bangalore once who told me that here's the unfortunate situation because of poverty again. He said, I might have a rare collection in a university library. Some professor from the West comes and slips a hundred dollar bill to the librarian and all of a sudden that book is marked as missing. And he says three or four months later, it appears in a digital collection behind a paywall in some uh, Western library. And he quoted to me four or five instances. I wouldn't like to mention that in this public talk, but uh, he, he quoted some of these things to me. So these things happen. So we have had, uh, because of poverty, we are losing a lot of these works. Because of earlier invasions, we lost a lot of works. And now because of intellectual theft, we continue to lose works. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I. There's another question that touches on languages, but I'm not too sure, Kelly, uh, did Dr. Vadam's uh, answer just deal with your question implicitly, or did you have a more specific question on that topic? Uh, not exactly. Uh, it was about um, the Proto-Indo-Aryan language, like the, <laughs> the hypothetical. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, like I, I was kind of brought up on... I guess I guess believing all believing that like there was this hypothetical language in Middle Asia someplace, and um, yeah, and, and then it kind of spread into Europe, uh, specifically like Lithuanian. The Lithuanian language has so many like, according to that theory, they have some of the most ancient words in their language of uh, like a lot of the European languages right. and I, I found that kind of intriguing um like how there would be such a connection um i just kind of curious on on what your take on uh on that kind of uh on that yeah yeah, yeah that, that's a good question so what we find is the, the colonial linguists had a theory and the theory was where do we place the homeland the homeland of the Urhemite was not a straightforward issue for the 18th, 19th century people, right? 
there, there were linguistic, there were nationalist notions. Some people wanted to locate the homeland of the ancestral language in Germany. Some people thought it's got to be in Armenia. Some people thought it's got to be in Russia. Some people in Caucasus. Some people said it should be in Northwest India. So after all these battles, they eventually landed between Caspian Sea and Black Sea, the Yamnaya people. They said that is where it should be because it is equidistant on the west to Scandinavia and to, on the east to India. Because of that reason, and no other reason, that was finally selected. Once you have a homeland, then you have to explain how these migration waves took this language to these various places. So the linguistic theories had to be constructed that way. And in service of that construction was this proto-Indo-Iranian as a buffer between this PIE language and Sanskrit language. If that is true, then the people who we call as Aryans, inverted quotes, in India must have come from Central Asia through Iran into India. Well, the paradoxes over here were noted by the British themselves. <laughs> In 1920, we had a British judge called Parjita. Please search for his name. F.E. Parjita, P-A-R-G-I-T-E-R. -E he remarked that it is such a paradox that if the Hindus entered India through the Northwest, where are the sacred spaces in the Northwest? He's saying there is not a single sacred space in the Northwest. All the sacred spots of the Indians are in the East, Varnasi, Banaras. That is in Eastern India. That is not in Punjab, Haryana, where if you expect they came from that side, that area should be sacred. That's the first thing he mentioned. And Parjita lists out about 20 points. He was a judge, right? So he uses a very um, uh, evidence-based perspective where he wants to have the facts over here. So he lists about uh, 10 or 20 facts where he says why the so-called Aryan influx into India is utter nonsense. He says, Every evidence that is examined shows it is an out of India going uh, uh, to, to this place. The next thing that Parjita says, he says, if you look at the mention of the rivers in the Vedas, the Vedas have got 10 books called Mandalas. These books are not in chronological order saying book one is the oldest, book two, book three after book 10. Rather, it's in a jumbled up order. Some of the oldest works of Rig Veda are some of those, later are something else. He is saying in the oldest works of the Rig Veda, the rivers mentioned are the ones to the east of the uh, uh, east of India. Then he's saying the later books are showing knowledge of the rivers in the west, the Indus and its tributaries in the west. He said, if they had entered India from the northwest, don't you think the river names would be preserved in that order? And why is it preserved in this order? So this uh, there are a lot of paradoxes like this he's brought up. And Srikant Talagiri is one more person who's taken up the same line of argument, expanded on that greatly. So you can look at both their works, and that shows uh, many paradoxes over there. The next part of your question was the Baltic people. Yes, the Lithuanians, the Slavic people seem to have tremendous affinity towards Sanskrit language and practices. Unfortunately, the Christianization of those places meant that their earlier practices were lost. We don't know. There are no works that show their earlier religion, their earlier practices. So whatever we have is here says that people have got in the 18th century and so on. But if you look at the language, we can see the close affinity it has got to Sanskrit. Why would it have affinity to Sanskrit of all languages? It, uh, it is not in closer to the so-called uh, Proto-Indo-European, but to Sanskrit. That is sitting at the Northwest corner there and India's in this Eastern corner there. You would expect if everything evolved from Proto-Indo-European, that should not be the way it is. So yes, there are paradoxes if we take the academically um, enforced narrative of this linguistic theory. Many, many paradoxes come, not only in archaeology, in the literature of these countries and the lived experiences, the divinities. Many, many areas show the paradoxes. The paradoxes can be resolved if the homeland is situated in Northwest India, this is the thesis of Srikant Talagiri. If the homeland is situated in Northwest India, all the paradoxes can be resolved, including the fact that there were Hittite people and Mitanni people who had a Sanskritic language in West Asia between Turkey and Northern Iraq. So uh, many, many points are there to uh, talk about, but uh, this is the gist of the argument that uh, their theory has come about because of uh, expediencies. You have a theory first, 
and you try to fit it. That is what has happened over there. So I guess um, mm. uh, confirmation bias has played a big role in the way they've done their uh, research. But uh, today we have got so much more counter examples that call into question that theory. Yeah, and for anybody listening, uh, either live or or on YouTube, um, for anybody who wants to hear Professor Vidam annihilate the Aryan invasion thesis and the whole, I mean, there's so much to that. Uh, the link in the description box will be tied to uh, Professor Vidam's previous lecture, which does, it, it blows that out of the water in great detail. So check that out. Um, Sundari has a question for you. So Sundari, there you are. Uh, Oh, and also Sesha has a question, but Sundari, I, I noticed first, so uh, yes, mine. go for it. Uh, my question is a very small question, which I have been personally putting and communicating with you, that all that research that is being done from the various uh, available archaeological, because I'm also in the same subject, I'm working on the Aryan invasion theory in the light of Shervindo. So literature is available you spoke about Brahmi script and all that because it's needed for everybody. Uh, there is literature in Sangam literature, Tamil, mainly Tamil, and even in the Pali, Prakrit, Buddhist literature and all, which would make it clear the historical facts. As it so happened that we are reading the history written after the 16th century from mm -hmm. English to Indian languages. So what we need urgently is that all the literature that is available in Indian languages to English and Western languages. Any initiatives being taken from the great university, Hindu university, this is my humble request. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Sundari because Ji. I yes, find I... myself in my own mother tongue. So much of history is written in Telugu, Tamil, our languages, Hindi, Pali, Prakrit, and I know French and uh, I'm French educated. So, I see that whatever is written in English, French is being translated into Indian languages. And if we, until Achille. we explore the literatures written in Indian languages, Bengali, Gujarati, even the most ancient Pali, Prakrit, Brahmi, then the real history will come out. So if any right. efforts are being taken for this direction, you are a very scholarly person. Thanks for all the colleagues also. I'm learning a lot from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sundariji. I'm aware that you're uh, translating in Telugu literature, so thank you for that. And I'll certainly try to make the connections as I encounter other scholars doing similarly. Thank you. There was a uh, question from Sesha. Yes. Uh, namaste. Uh, uh, namaste. I had taken a class uh, from Hindi University of I recognize you, yes. Back. And that was uh, triggered by seeing a YouTube on untold civilization of India randomly. So that was really great. And uh, thanks a lot for all the great work you're doing. So uh, one question I had was, um, so we talk about Ramayana and Mahabharata, the epics. And uh, they were written at that time is what we learned. If they were written, at that time, say for Mahabharata, which is more than 5,000 years old, mm -hmm. and Ramayana, which is maybe more than 30,000 years old, mm -hmm. then if they were written, so the script, written script was already there. Having said that, what language was it written? Excellent questions. I, I don't have good answers for you, unfortunately, because our knowledge doesn't go back to that much. There are, what we know is before Paninian grammar, we had classical Sanskrit. And after Paninian grammar, we had a different, uh, not I won't call it different, more regulated, structured Sanskrit. So people are aware of that. In fact, even the British Indologists, they try to see in the various Indian texts, where are the archaic words, words that have fallen out of favor in later, later works. They try to see the frequency of those words and by doing that, they were able to say this is an earlier text, this is a later text, and things of that nature, or use of a certain phrase that has fallen out of fashion. They were able to do that. So we know that uh, languages evolve. There's no doubt about it. Languages always do evolve. But we also know that a grammar, which is the last stage in development of a language, effectively puts a break on unrestricted growth. If you did not have a grammar, there is unrestricted growth. It grows in whatever directions. 
but grammar really enforces you follow some structure rules then afterwards maybe somebody makes a word fashionable vocabulary increases a little bit that kind of thing happens but eventually the rate of change pace slows down after grammar so uh, uh, after parinian's work i would think that there is more uh, uh, the pace of change is reduced i cannot predict what it might have been prior to that in today's talk i've been talking about neolithic communities going back 12000 years when neolith by neolithic because that is a time frame when people don't have to say man am i going to eat today has uh, my husband uh, has he gone and uh, killed something for me to eat hunter gatherer right so you don't have to worry about those kind of things rather you have to uh, uh, if you are neolithic you are growing all the food you want storing it in your home you have the leisure time where you can pursue these arts you can pursue learning you can pursue various things so neolithic times are traced back to 12000 years 15000 years today what might have the language been it's fascinating but i don't have an answer for you i don't know it, it would have been seems so logical because the language the valmiki ramayana which they say the first original script or 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 written work uh, is in sanskrit so it seems so logical to connect as per the knowledge that little bit agree. knowledge that i have that it must have been their the language which didn't change much because like you said the grammar must have been so refined and the pronunciation is also based on very scientific uh, right right uh, exactly uh, exactly frequency. i was coming and to that it's just and my 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 perception excellent excellent observation uh, shishi ji so my 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 uh, uh, in the class i mentioned the same thing that indians had an oral recitation tradition which had error communication uh, uh, mechanisms built into it just like today if we are doing electronic communication using cell phones or whatever we have certain error transmission of error code so that we can ensure that the digital communication is correct some bit has not become zero to one in transmission in electronics engineering we do all of these things indians had that in terms of something called the padas the various padas we have gram pada and various other padas these are ways of reciting for example you could break up a verse into many um, phrases if you will and you had a formula the way you recite it like for example if you say uh, 1 2 3 4 you might have the straightforward recitation is 1 2 3 4 a second formula might be 1 2 2 3 3 4 and so on a third one might be 1 2 3 2 3 4 or going backwards forwards and so on and so forth so by doing the recitation in this way they were able to catch errors so this kind of uh, fidelity in transmission was outstanding in the indian oral tradition so this is one reason why i say we should not emphasize that only the written record is uh, valuable in history because the oral transmission in india was of high fidelity and so that also should be admitted as a means of uh, historical tradition so it should not be pushed to prehistory in that sense so anyway uh, so the vedas contains all the archaic language archaic usages of words and they were transmitted perfectly so the way you hear a vedic pandit uh, reciting these vedas is probably how it was however distant you want to go in the past today i told a rigvedic story of surya ashvin and ushas going back to 7200 bce which means by that time the story was already in place in rigveda so for the last 9000 years this recitation has been in this particular form so there are many things to say here may but i i cannot tell you uh, how what kind of script might have been used what kind of uh, uh, language could have been there we don't know academia western academia has tried to reconstruct what is called proto indo european based upon what they call sound laws that some sound like i told in my talk today the pa sound becomes a pa become a fa and such things so by proposing those kind of sound laws that try to reconstruct the chronology saying this is an older form this is a later form and therefore this sound from here becomes this they search for words with similar meanings in different languages called cognates and try to break it up where is a sound formed is it formed in the uh, in the back of the throat is it formed with a tongue hitting the top of the mouth is it formed with a tongue hitting the back of the teeth or maybe with a ref reflex like ta da tha pa ma or by touching the lips together ma pa and things of this nature so the morphology of the sound 
and the kind of uh, projected old new forms made them come up with what they call laws, but I call it band-aid fixes. Whenever a counterexample is found, found, you make a new law to patch over that one. So they came up with a jumble of ideas, which is called uh, linguistic theory today, which forms the proto-Indo-European uh, corpus of works that they have. With that, and with the historical tradition, they say this is how languages evolved. But the reality is, not a single prediction has been done with this theory. To my knowledge, not a single prediction has been done for any extinct language or existing language showing how this could have become that. So it will work in the context of the word list, something called a Swadesh word list, 100 words, 200 words. You use that list in the context of that, you might be able to do it. But go outside the context and see, does the theory work? To my knowledge, it has never worked. So a theory must be, must work at least outside its parameters slightly, but not this. So it's a reconstruction. What is its value? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll have time for the last two questions uh, for today. So we have uh, Harinder and then one more question. So uh, Harinder, go for it. Thank you, Professor Vedam, uh, for your very informative pre presentation of suppressed history and suppressed philosophy and the connections of India to the past, which unfortunately our own uh, colonial experience has caused us to forget. And, and you know, even today, the influence of American and British culture and European culture is very strong. And so many Indians are um, influenced by by the United States um, and we have lost that culture. And so you're, I hope this is uh, part of a movement which starts to resuscitate our forgotten language and our forgotten histories and our forgotten philosophies. For instance, the Ramayana and, and Mahabharata, uh, in passing, I'll just mention that the best translation I found was paradoxically by an American called William Buck. Uh, and I, I recommend those. He, he says in his preface that he has taken some poetic license, but he gets very close to the poetry of, of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So, so that being said, I, 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 I would like you to put on this uh, uh, through, through Matthew, perhaps, that paper that you cited in which you analyzed uh, what was for me my theory uh, uh, about how an achutism, you know, untouchability came to India. Mm -hmm. I had a very nasty argument with somebody who was born in Guyana and he was very much hooked on to uh, the wokeism of a few years ago, which was also used to attack the caste system in India. And you've described the caste system was perverted by the, you know, European imperialists, the British. And you, I, it was it was my uh, my my intuitive uh, feeling that untouchability was caused by exactly this reason, medical reasons, and you have provided uh, a more detailed description of that. So, I would like to see that whole paper put on here. Sure, sure. please please go to academia.edu and search for my name, and you'll find several of my papers there. Also on YouTube, on YouTube, please search for my name along with Esther E S T H E R. And uh, take a look at our talks. We got several talks over there. This topic is handled in more detail over there, as well as in academia.edu. Uh, you'll find some papers which I presented at the WAVES conference. Okay. Uh, so that out of the way, I uh, have a couple of uh, some thoughts and uh, which your presentation has so much information that uh, very critical things were just, uh, you know, um, glanced at, for instance, the, the the doctrine of discovery by the Pope, uh, which led to the colonization and the treatment of anybody who was not Christian as being declared outside the grace of God, etc. And you could loot them, rob them, kill them, enslave them, etc. And that has been the history of this planet for the last 500 years. Um, so those kinds of things need to be brought more to the forefront and your presentation contained that was just one of hundreds of facts in your presentation which you know so uh, the, now a lot of that earlier history that you describe about the transmission of information and influence from india to the greeks and then and also later on to the, to the islamic peoples uh, 
that is probably not as well supported by documentary evidence because for the reasons that you mentioned the Shruti tradition of India, of oral trans transmission. So, wait, so it's one minute, so I beg to defer on that uh, statement you made. The, there is documented evidence from the Islamic sources themselves okay. about the books they have taken from India and translated that from the 7th century onwards. We have a pretty reliable record of what are the books, who are the translators in the Arabic tradition as well as in the Latin tradition. We have a uh, Gerard of Cremona, the books that he translated. We have a fairly good idea. But what about the connections to Pythagoras and so on? That, that is also documented. Pythagoras also, uh, from early works, Apollonius of Tyna, from works like Clements, who lived maybe, yes, in time, they are 500, 600 years remote from Pythagoras, but closer in time than us. But there are anecdotal, not anecdotal, there are actually writings. Apollonius of Tyna was a student. He mentions about Pythagoras learning from India. And this these have been handled by Western scholars, German A.N. Marlowe and uh, G.R.S. Mead. These are the people who are talking about uh, Pythagoras. And there are a whole lot of others. I think the tradition of Pythagoras in India is not a new one. It's not something that I've invented. There's a lot of people who talk about this. Okay, I'm glad to hear them. Pleased to hear that. All right, there, there, there's so much to discuss. I'll just conclude with a, with a, with a quick question. Uh, you mentioned in many of the slides uh, the nine numer nine numbers, and yes. then at, at, in one slide you mentioned the decimal. So where exactly did the number zero get invented? Was it India or was it the Arabics? Absolutely not Arabics. It is in India. There's no doubt about it at all for several reasons. So uh, several people tried to see where did the symbol for zero come from. Zero was used implicitly in the cuneiform tradition. It was used implicitly in the Greek tradition as just a place with nothing over there. But a lot of errors obviously came that kind of way, very unfairly to do that. A symbol came at some point. The question was, who made the symbol for zero? Where did it come from? So some people said it came, the earliest evidence in a temple in Cambodia in the 7th century. Somebody else said in Gwalior, there's a temple with that tradition. But recently, recently means 2018, the Bodleian Library, Oxford, they did carbon dating on their version of the Bakshali manuscript. Bakshali manuscript was found at the turn of the earlier century, 1900s, early 1900s. It was found in a place called Bakshali near Peshawar in near Pakistan. Palm leaves that are disordered greatly. It was given to a man called, um, forget his name, forget his name. Anyway, I forget his name, a colonial person who uh, tried to uh, make the first translation of uh, Bakshali manuscript. Then a Eurocentric man called GHK, he uh, inherited that and he also made some assertions on that. So many people thought that Bakshali manuscript is a much later document. But Bodleian Library's carbon dating showed it is 200 current era. And that document has clear evidence of zero as a symbol used over there. There are scholars who have decoded what those uh, computations are. And I, in my class, I deal with uh, many of the problems from the Bakshali manuscript. So uh, please do search for Bakshali manuscript. You'll find the earliest documented evidence of zero that we have is over here. But philosophically, we have a tradition of zero going even earlier than that. You might be familiar with the very famous Brihadaranyaka Upanishad uh, mantra, the Spur Namidam, Pur Namida this mantra. This word, what, what this mantra says is that from infinity, you take away infinity, it remains infinity, and so on. So the concept of infinity is over there. The concept of shunya is over there. So philosophically, we have these concepts going back much, much earlier times. Thank you. I salute you. Your knowledge is far, far, far superior to mine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Srinivas, go for it. Namaste. Thank you so much. Namaste. Uh, Dr. Vedam, it's always a wonderful pleasure to um, to listen to you. Um, you. I have um, I have listened to many of your presentations. It's not just the content, but the the persuasiveness with which you make your arguments are, you know, unignorable. So I commend you and thank you for doing that. So uh, my question is, you know, before the access, before the Internet era, you know, much of this, uh, uh, the in, especially with the, regarding the Indian knowledge systems, much of the scholarly work was produced by academicians. 
and disseminated, uh, distributed by traditional media and other sort of books, you know, uh, traditional means. But with the internet, uh, access has become sort of, it's, there's more equity in access. Everybody can access the original sources, which is what is beautiful. And people like you have actually brought out the glaring sort of uh, gaps in, in the information regarding to the Indian knowledge systems. So as far as the public space is concerned, in the social media, you have brought a lot of awareness. The consciousness is increasingly aware of the, these problems. But how do you see the path going back to the academia? Sorry. Uh, pause. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. So, so the academia is what um, controls textbooks, for example, right? right? The school textbook, what our children read about our own culture in America, for example, or other places. Or when you Google what credible sources, what so-called credible sources still reflect the, the, the old views. So how do you see the journey from what new discoveries that uh, people like you are giving coming back to ref be reflected in the academia, which is a very important step? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for the question. So uh, in the beginning of my talk, I called out to call attention to the agencies that control historiography of India. Among the last two were the uh, Socialist Academic Media, uh, sorry, Socialist Academia and the Marxist. These forces are not unique to India. They exist yeah. in America also and in Europe to a very large extent. And for uh, whatever reason, they find uh, bedfellows with uh, 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 fundamentalists, whether it's in Islam or Christianity, because these narratives are convenient to a number of agencies. They also suit the foreign policy of some countries at this point. If you look at United States, that's Council for Religious Freedom, how it finds it fit to hit India each time it wants a leverage, you, you find that it also serves those kind of purposes. So uh, I don't think it's going to be an easy path for academia to do it. In the most idealistic sense, academia is a place where we evaluate new ideas, we challenge ideas, and we come up with new thinking, or we... Uh, uphold old thinking. This is what academia is expected to do. That appears to be true in the physical sciences because there's money to be made yeah. out of technology, but yeah. it does not appear to be true today, at least in the liberal arts. In the liberal arts, it's the opinion of a heavyweight that matters much more than factual evidence. You can come with any amount of factual evidence that you like, but they'll say Max Miller has said this and Max Miller's ideas were these. And so the, 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 the kind of artifices they use is credentialing. Are you a history uh, professor? Are you yeah. licensed to work on this area? And the, the, the next best thing they can do is to uh, broad brush you, right? Broad brush me and say that you're a Hindutva person, Hindu nationalist, or a fascist ideologue, and things of this nature. But I always say the same thing that I am using published sources to talk. And my expectation is that if you're an interlocutor, you need to address these issues and challenge me, challenge me. But the issue is I can't even get it published, my ideas in any of these journals, because these are not welcome ideas. We can write, we can write uh, for uh, panels in these conferences of AHA, American Historical Association and others, but our panel proposals will never be picked up because these are not what the academia wants. Rather, the panels in American Historical Association is, why Hindutva is controlling the narrative? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? These are the kind of panels that are set up and not these kind of panels, where we'd expect in a conference setting, people can come, listen to your conference, challenge you, and then maybe take a new line of thinking. That does not happen. So unfortunate, the only way I see it is, for more people to push that we need to be multidisciplinary in our thinking. We need to be evidence-based in our thinking. We need to try to analyze everything, the rational framework. Are there other answers that fit the framework? Have we analyzed the other answers? Can that also fit the scenario? I said lactase persistence in Europe. Okay, how many things can contribute to lactase persistence? We enumerate them, rule them out, or collect evidence towards one or the other. That is a rational examination that we should 
ask. I don't always uh, meet that uh, mark, but that's a goal we work towards. But that is what I would expect from academia. But academia is not equipped. The, the liberal arts people are not equipped to deal with multidisciplinary evidence. If I come with a climatology paper that is talking about oxygenating isotopes in the early times and monsoon failures, there's no way that they can uh, 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 easily make sense out of a paper like that. So they either take it at uh, pedigree value, pedigree meaning that it came from Harvard, it must be good. It came from MIT, it must be good. So pedigree triumphs over reason. <laughs> Right. So, right. so this, this, this is the kind of thing we frequently see in liberal arts. And uh, today, the entire field is controlled by this cabal that I keep talking about in my talks, starting with colonial, Eurocentric, missionary, that received wisdom has been got by the socialist academia, which is left-leaning, and by the Marxists today. And today, expanded upon with newer actors, with the Islamists, the wokeism, and other people. Everything is in service of Marxism. Everything is divided into the smallest division possible, oppressor, oppressed. The divisions are brought to your family between husband, wife, gender, Absolutely. Uh, between even the battles in yourself, the individual, am I a man, am I a woman, the, uh, the, the spectrum that you have. So the battle is taken to the logical conclusion that you are at battle with yourself. <laughs> indeed, so indeed. You're seeing, you're seeing the enormous success of Marxism out there. <laughs> so, so that, uh, you know, if I may tag uh, a, a, another question to my earlier question, a question that you've been asked before, I think I've seen it on Twitter. Given that you bring in this unique multidisciplinary sort of um, viewpoint to looking at Indian knowledge systems, when are you writing your book? That's a, that's a most difficult question to answer. So I still have I still have a full time day job that pays for my bills. So <laughs> I hope when I retire, I have enough uh, neurons left to write a book logically. It's a lot of effort, but I do hope so. I do hope so. I, I've been criticized on this by a lot of my close friends, but uh, the pressure is there. A lot of pressure is there. So I hope to get there. Please, please do. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to make a comment, Matthew, very quickly. That uh yeah sure but a quick comment yes professor Redham, I, your last comment about Mar it being all this being marxism i would just ask you to consider the possibility that a small globalist elite of billionaires and trillionaires are perverting what may have been marxist ideology in order to in inflict these divisions upon us for instance it's a small this small group through the world economic forum is pushing a whole bunch of uh, insane uh, ideologies uh, on people, and the media is uh, brainwashed uh, with the idea that this is all coming from the left because they themselves have planted their leaders on the left side to make it appear as if we on the left, which is a 99%, are doing it to ourselves. But it is really the elite that is imposing this dictatorship. So the, the narrative has been controlled. The narrative has certainly been controlled. And so thinking people everywhere need to evaluate the facts. I think that's what it comes to. And I think we have a duty to try to tell it to our fellow people. My last line, my slide was, we need to reevaluate the values that we have, not the ones programmed into us by the media. That's Yeah. Yeah, those are words to live by. Uh, we have a, a little watch party at our at our house, a professor of people in the other room. And uh, one of my friends, Kevin, uh, knocked on the door saying, can I please ask the last question? So, sure, of, please, course, go ahead. of course, yeah, I can't say no. So, Kevin, yeah, come on in. Well, thank you for this talk, uh, Dr. Vedam. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to go back on uh, an earlier question regarding the number zero and how it came uh, to the West. So uh, a couple of months back, I did a talk for the RTF about uh, al Khwarizmi's work as a bridge to, uh, in between uh, Asia and uh, Europe. And you briefly, briefly touched on him as the one who, um, well, introduced the, the decimal system and um, also the the nine number digits. Um, I've read somewhere, and this is something that I want to um, do a little bit more of research on because this is something also that Matthew asked uh, ask me a lot about, is uh, the negative numbers. So I've read that the negative numbers came also from India. And so I was wondering if you had any information uh, in that regards. Sure. Yes. So we can start with the negative number question. So from Brahmagupta, if you take a look at Brahmagupta, 
you'll find he was a, a mathematician who lived in the late 16, uh, sorry, 600 current era, maybe uh, 650 or so. I'm, I, I cannot answer, uh, tell you the date exactly. Brahma Gupta, that's his name. So he wrote famous works called Brahma Sputta Siddhanta. It's a mouthful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, so in, in that work, you find negative numbers, you find rules for operation. Uh, positive plus positive, negative plus negative, positive times negative, negative times positive. All these rules are enumerated there. They didn't get the outliers very well. The, for example, zero divided by something divided by zero. Those are still difficult concepts. Some of them got it, some of them did not. These, excuse me. These were also talked about by Bhaskara II, who lived in 1100 in Eugene. So he expanded on this box. So Brahmagupta and the son. Brahmagupta's works were translated by the Muslims in Baghdad. And I think it became Sindh Hind. Brahma's Putta Siddhanta became Sindh Hind in the Arabic tradition. And Al-Karazmi and others who uh, used these works, they wrote their uh, essays, rather their books, their tomes, they wrote on these works. And uh, uh, Al-Karazmi was popular, the one for popularizing this to the West. So you, are, you got absolutely right there. And there were- I, uh, Sorry, just to cut, cut you off a little bit. Am I correct in uh, thinking that, well, uh, that they were thinking about negative numbers in terms of, uh, in, in the monetary sense? Yes, to make... yes, profit right. loss. In, Indian, Indian mathematics, Indian, everything was applied. It was never abstract for the sake of abstract. It was applied in that sense. So in applied mathematics, if, if you go to Bakshali manuscript, do search for Bakshali manuscript online. And there's a, a nice write-up on that by Mac Tutor. I think that's a university in the US, that uh, sorry, UK, that has a, a essay on that. So there you'll find even the problems discussed in the Bakshali manuscript are of a mathematical nature. Bakshali manuscript has got problems on commerce. It has got problems on interest calculation. It has got uh, problems on various other things. So very interesting to see that. And talking about that, even in a work called Arthashastra. Arthashastra was a work written by somebody called Chanakya and approximately 300 BCE. That has got to do with computing interest. That has got to do with commerce, mathematics of commerce, and so on. So you're seeing uh, over there itself ideas of profit, loss coming. But implicitly, the, uh, the explicitly, the negative numbers come from Brahmagupta's works. But those ideas have been around for some time. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Well, Professor, you have given us an immense amount of substance to, to chew on, to think about, and, uh, and a lot of challenges for researchers as well who are curious to think, well, what am I going to write about for my thesis? What am I going to investigate going forward? And I think you've scratched the surface of a lot of paradoxes and discoveries that are yet to be made or have to be proven. Um, but it's very exciting, the doors that, that are being presented to be opened. Uh, so thank you. Thank you immensely. I, I'm withholding so many questions I had on Alexander the Great and the Silk. I'm, I'm going to be writing you email questions. I'm going to I'm going to annoy you a little bit uh, going forward. But thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to future presentations from you. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time this Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, others, for joining in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.